Hi everyone, on behalf of myself, the Idea Center for Applied Ethics at the University of Leeds and my co-organizer, Zach Goodmanson, I would like to welcome you to the Philosophy and AI Workshop. We're very grateful for the amount of interest that the event had, so we hope you get the most of it. Just to let everyone know, we are also live streaming on YouTube and we will post a link to the whole event on our website in case you want to access it later. For today, we'll have three speakers. They will have 30 minutes to present and then we will have 30 minutes for Q&A. We encourage you to write your questions on the Q&A dedicated chat throughout the talk or near the end. My colleague Zach uh, will be our moderator so we also encourage you to use the upvote feature um, for the questions you're most interested in. So they get, to ask, be, they get to be asked first. And since we do not have an opportunity to have a regular conversation and interactions amongst attendees, having a flexible and dynamic Q&A might help with this. We're trying something new, so hopefully you enjoy commenting and presenting your questions there. Also remember that if you want to add additional details to the question you typed in the Q&A section, you need to add a live question right next to the end. Um, but in any case, if you have doubts, just you can ask Zach in the chat and he'll help you. Well, now uh, we're going to start um, and I get to present our first speaker of the day. As you might have noticed, we had a bit of a change in the original schedule, and this was due to the uncertainties of this pandemic. Um, luckily, despite having his traveling schedule changed, um, Professor Vincent Miller was able to join us from the airport today, so we're really grateful to him. At some point, he will have to leave early um, during the Q&A section, but luckily we have the collaboration of the co-author of the paper this presentation is based on, Michael Cannon from the Technical University of Eindhoven to help us out with any further questions you might have. So without further ado, I would like to present Professor Vincent Muller. He's a professor in ethics of technology at the Technical University of Eindhoven, an academic fellow at the University of Leeds and Turing fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Today, he will be presenting Orthogonality and existential risk from AI. Can we have it both ways? Okay. Um, thanks, Gabby, for that introduction. Um, obviously, I will try to share my screen. As you can see, well, as you cannot see, but anyway, I am at an airport. You remember airports, I suppose. It's rare nowadays to get to an airport and my flight was cancelled two days ago and so that's why uh, we had this scheduling issue. Um, let me share my screen. And uh, yeah, I think that should work. So thanks a lot for inviting me to this event. Uh, it is of course uh, very fitting that uh, uh, we speak about these things because the people who organize the event are PhD students of mine. And, um, and the, my co-author on this paper is also a PhD student of mine. So it's kind of an internal affair, as it were. Um, so um, Michael uh, Cannon is writing his PhD on super ethical AI. And we came across the orthogonality thesis in that work. And we thought something funny is going on here. Um, and we needed to investigate this. So this is what I want to talk about now. Um, essentially, we will do a little bit of an exposition of some basic things, which I think most of you will already know, but the basic idea of the singularity claim and the argument to existential risk from AI. Um, we will then suggest that there is a problem with that argument, uh, maybe a trick of some sort. We'll try to repair that problem. Um, that won't work. Uh, and uh, <coughs> then suggest that there is a fundamental issue with the argument. Background to this, as I said, is already that is that Michael and I work together on these subjects. Uh, another piece of the background is that uh, I used to work with Nick Bostrom on these subjects and we uh, made some investigations on 
when we would expect some kind of super intelligent AI to happen. <clears throat> we did ask a group of uh, various groups of people about this uh, about, yes, like five, six years ago. And uh, we asked them about what we called human level machine intelligence. So this is a thing that we invented. Uh, the idea being that it is uh, the intelligence of a machine that could do any kind of human profession, more or less. And the outcome of that discussion was that people said uh, the probability of that occurring uh, would go over 50% in the year 2040. So it'd be more likely than not from 2040. Pretty soon, in other words. The other bit uh, that's relevant here as background is that I've been working on, or I'm, I'm working on the ethics of AI and robotics. And I've written the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia article on that, uh, which I'm trying to sort of sort out what the issues are, which is not obvious. And I think probably needs to re be revised in some ways, but um, so that's the background. Um, so here's the beginning of the of the typical sort of singularity argument from Kurzweil. Um, so Ray Kurzweil has stressed, I think uh, very rightly so, uh, the importance of the exponential growth of computing. Exponential growth is a feature that humans aren't very good at grasping. Uh, we tend to think, yeah, it's sort of getting faster, but but how much faster and even how much the acceleration of the uh, speed itself might uh, change. We, I find that often quite hard to grasp intuitively. So here's a logarithmic graph uh, on which he has these red dots. These are actual computing systems. And on the horizontal axis, we have years. On the vertical one, we have calculations per second per $1,000. So it's not just computing speed, but it is also computing speed per price, because the price also goes down, which is important in the real world. So he, the white line, which I hope you can see on your screen, is sort of the trajectory that he expects that this thing will take. Um, and he assumes that uh, it will be overtaking the level of computations on a human brain uh, around 2030. Uh, or I think 25, I'm not so sure, somewhere there, pretty close anyway. Uh, evidently, a lot of people have complained about one aspect of this discussion, namely that he just talks about computing speed, and obviously there is more intelligence than computing speed. So uh, I leave that on the side for the time being. That's just a general idea. There is going to be this, this exponential growth, and then these machines will be reaching human level, and they'll go beyond human level, and what is going to happen then? So the basic idea is what I call the singularity claim, namely that we will have an intelligence explosion at some point. That is when the machines will reach human level, uh, then they will be able to accelerate the rate of uh, improvement themselves. So we will not do the AI, the AIs will do the AI. Uh, and, and things will get much, much better, much, much faster. So there is this idea that this will be sort of going up really, really quickly. The definition of superintelligent that people like Bostrom use is that it's intellects that greatly outperform uh, the, the, best, the, current, the best current human minds across very many general cognitive domains. Um, okay. So, and step two from there is to say, uh, if that occurs, then there's going to be a risk. So it's important to realize that superintelligence and singularity are not the same thing. And it's important to realize that from the singularity, there's a second step which says, we think that that will produce existential risk. Um, uh, Kurzweil, for example, did not think of it like that. Kurzweil thinks of this as a really positive development which will open all sorts of beautiful trajectories. Uh, so Bostrom obviously faces, uh, stresses existential risk and says that um, the major issue is um, that we won't be able in con to control things and <clears throat> sort of the machines will take over. The details of that uh, are often left out in some way, but that is one thing that we will need to discuss. Um, so one aspect of that discussion that later turned out to be uh, important is the orthogonality thesis. So. In order to get to existential risk, you 
also have to assume in addition to the loss of control that the intelligent beings that we will have there, the super intelligent beings will be somehow could have any kind of goals. So they will not be really, really good morally, but they could have all sorts of views. So he says, so there are these two things, intelligence and goals are orthogonal, right? That's what this word is trying to, trying to suggest. Any kind of combination is possible there. Um, so any kind of goal could, level of intelligence could in principle be combined with any kind of goal. I'm sorry. I might be careful to see, but I hope it's not too loud. Um, so, uh, the orthogonality thesis implies that these... Um, Please consult the information monitors, shippel.nl or the shippel app for your current flight status. Good. <laughs> now you know where I am. Uh, the orthogonality thesis implies that synthetic minds could have all sorts of weird goals, inclu including sun grain counting or pip pip maximizing or something like that. Okay. Gabby, if you want me to mute myself or if you want to mute me, then, then please do that. Yeah, I think that that was it for announcements. Okay, good. So we could have these, I hope you had time to read the, the quotes. So we could have these weird goals. Okay, so this is the combination. The combination of these two produces the argument for existential risk, right? So A, super intelligence is a realistic prospect and would be out of human control. That's what we call the singularity claim. And B, any level of intelligence can go with any goal. That's the orthogonality thesis. From that, you get existential risk. So you need both of these, that's important. So is there a trick? We think there is a trick here. And the trick is that the argument from superintelligence to existential risk assumes something like general intelligence. So you sort of imagine what it would it be like to be like me, but much, much smarter, right? And then what would you be able to do? It's, a, it's very speculative, right? It sometimes looks like theology really. Um, but that's the general idea. In the orthogonality thesis, it seems to us, there's a different notion of intelligence at play, which we call in instrumental intelligence, to, namely the ability to reach specific goals in a very efficient way. So, and if that's true, then we're having a problem because we're looking at different notions of intelligence in different parts of the argument. And we can't get them together into a conclusion. Um, so here's the illustration of that. So really the premises are super intelligent AI is a realistic prospect, general, and would be out of human control. And any level of intelligence can go with any goals, instrumental intelligence, right? So the conclusion becomes a mess because then we don't know which super intelligence are we talking about anymore. Is it general or instrumental? So instrumental intelligence is basically the kinds of ideas that you might have heard of if you've done any kind of AI work or computing work really, uh, namely the capacity for reasoning for optimal plans towards a goal. It's the kind of thing that people discuss in decision theory, right? So you basically say, what's a rational agent? A rational agent is the kind of thing that maximizes expected utility. Uh, it's a well-known fact that humans aren't rational agents and even Computers probably can't be, at least fully, but the idea is that that is a form of intelligence. If you have a goal, you maximize uh, your uh, path towards it. <laughs> in, the under, in the other sense, as I said, it's sort of the assumption that we sort of have this general thing. It's sort of like us. And one, I think, relevant feature here that is different from the instrumental one is that you can widen the frame, what we call you can widen the frame of reflection. So. For example, let's say you have an instrumental intelligence that is trying to win the chess games. Um, when a human plays a chess game, they might think at some point, is it actually a good idea to win this chess game? So for example, let's say you play a teenager and you might realize that they're not very good at this. There are teenagers who are enormously good, but you know, just assume. Uh, then you might think, well, it's actually not a good idea to sort of squash them right? Maybe it's a better idea to give them a serious chance of winning. That would be more fun. 
you could even widen the, widen the frame further and say, you know, we should maybe stop playing chess because I don't know, dinner is ready or there's a lion in the room or something, right? So, so we can reflect on these things and we'd reflect on our goals. So, so that is really an important aspect of our uh, human, the way we see ourselves as humans and other people. We think of ourselves as responsible agents because not only do we have goals, but we can also rationally reflect on these goals and change them. And then we are properly responsible for our actions. So um, are there ways to sort of combine these two things, other ways to have it both ways? So there was the two possibilities. Either we could have orthogonality with general intelligence or we can have singularity with instrumental. <clears throat> so, sorry, let me just see what I'm doing, yeah. So. Uh, orthogonality with general intelligence uh, seems to be uh, not very promising. Here the idea is that suddenly we shouldn't be able to reflect on our goals anymore. So remember, orthogonality means you can have any goal with it. I believe we're having some technical problems. We will try to figure out what's happening. Apologies to everyone. We believe that Vincent is having trouble at the airport. Um, apologies for that. Um, we're gonna try to get him back um, as soon as possible. Uh, so bear with us and apologies once again. Hi everyone, just in the meantime, while we wait for Vincent, then um, if you do have any questions on the talk so far, the way we're doing the Q&As is that you can put in your question in the Q&A section, and then you can vote on questions which you wanna hear the answer to. So, oh, Vincent's come back, so uh, Vincent, <laughs> yes. you can- so, Sorry for that, apparently the Wi-Fi kicked me out. Now I'm connected with my phone, so I'll try that again. Apologies. Um, good. Yeah, I'm back. I'm almost finished anyway. But yeah, good. So, so I was I was at point B. So the repair. This is the repairs, right? So, so how about having um, super intelligent AI in the instrumental sense, and whether that would produce a problem? So I explained the or mentioned the King Midas problem. It could be that you produce a super intelligence that is really, really good at reaching some goals. And then you discover that you don't really want it to reach these goals. After all, um, you know, uh, one example that Stuart Russell uses is to say, get me to the airport as fast as possible. Right. And you might think that, that that is much, much faster than you really want. Right. Um, so there is such a possibility. It seems to me, however, that it's quite clear that it is uh, not very easy to get a quick loss of control uh, out of that, right? Because the, because the agent would be controlled with its in its uh, in the goals that that it get, has. It it will pursue the goals that you give it. Um, so here is an illustration for for the view uh, under A. Um, so imagine that you have like a sort of alpha zero, sort of plus, 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 right? A super version of it, a super intelligent version. It, it's supposed to be able to produce existential risk. So it's supposed to be able to have thoughts like the ones under A to under one, two, three, 
So, uh, for example, I can't win at Go if I'm turned off, so I'll absolutely make sure that that won't happen, right? I know I know everything about the world to make sure that that is not going to happen. Or the more I dominate the world, the better my chances to maximize my playing. My playing, so so I will uh, therefore make sure I get all the electricity or stuff like that, right? These are scenarios people talk about. At the same time, supposedly this this machine should not be able to think about things like winning by playing better is better than winning by bribery, or keeping a promise is better than not keeping it, generally speaking, or that stabbing a human being hurts them, or even very simply that maximal overall utility is better than maximal minimal overall utility. So that seems weird. Why is it accessible to the one but not the other? But if it only has instrumental intelligence, then that seems to be a problem. So I sum up, it seems to me that the singularity claim and the orthogonality thesis might both be true, but only if we understand them with these little indices there uh, properly. Uh, and <clears throat> there are forms of intelligence that make existential risk plausible and other forms that make orthogonality plausible, but we don't see a way that you can have both of these things. So you can have both of these graphs on the left-hand side, right? That you, you get both of these, uh, things together. That seems to be a problem. And so we basically throw that problem back at the people who think there is this ex existential risk and say, you know, how can we, how can we do that? Uh, needless to mention, or perhaps not needless to mention, everything that we say in this paper might well be false. Okay. So it might well be that uh, existential risk from AI is up and coming, and therefore it would be a good idea, given that there is a significant possibility that we are completely wrong here, to think about these things, right? So we do not conclude that thinking about super intelligent AI and existential risk from it is a waste of time, on the contrary. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mueller, for that talk. Um, so we'll move into questions now. We're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I think we'll take maybe five minutes to um, think about generate some questions. Um, you can so you can put the questions in the Q and A section, um, and then hopefully if we get a few questions, then you can vote also on questions which you want to hear the answer to, and then we can um, answer the questions in order of who's voted for them. Um, if you do want to ask your question on video, then just put so just put live question or something like that after your question, and we can activate your your microphone and you can ask the question live. But let's take five minutes, so we'll come back at 17 past and um, get on with some questions. Thanks again.
Okay. Um, thanks everyone for submitting questions. You can still keep on submitting questions and voting on them. Um, I think I will give you the ability to talk um, after Vincent answer your initial question and just um, so you can thank him or ask a, a quick follow up if you need to. Um, but let's start with the highest voted question. Are you ready, Professor Mover? Ah, you're muted. Can I unmute you? There we go. Is that me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, my connection is far from stable, I'm afraid. Um, should I try to re reply a little bit to these um, to these points that were made in the in the Q and A? Yes. Um, yeah. do, do you want me to read it out, or do you want to read no, it out? I, Probably I one can, of us should. I can see it. Yeah. I think other people can see it too, but okay. Cool. Anyway, so so me. Yates' uh, point that um, intelligence requires self-regulation. Um, to be honest, I didn't know that story by Gilbert Ryle, um, even though I studied it in Gilbert Ryle's college, Lineker. Um, so I am not sure what to make of this. I very much suspect that, uh, so I would just need to look at it, very much suspect that this is the kind of notion of intelligence which you usually find in the literature which is then trying to explain human intelligence right and then so it is what i would call general intelligence um, and self-regulation in the sense that uh, it would require me to be able to control to some extent uh, what i think and what i do is exactly the kind of thing that is discussed in the areas of free will and responsibility. So I think that would be exactly the kind of thing that we're looking at. Um, Dilara Bora makes the point that uh, intelligence by definition already implies flexibility. Yes, I think I think that's a very, if you take it sufficiently broadly. So uh, yes, a system, let's say, that is trying to, uh, uh, let's say, get out of the door uh, and will try only uh, to turn the knob uh, is not a very intelligent system. Damn it. For you and on the veiligheid, let your eigendom and not unbeheerd achter. Problem again. For um, security reasons, keep a so, close watch on your personal belongings. So I think the question is, how much flexibility do you want to have in this area? That seems to me is the issue. So is there a middle ground where you get uh, enough, or I should say enough flexibility so that it produces existential risk, but, but not so much that it threatens orthogonality, right? That is, seems to me is the challenge. I don't really see how that, how that could work. That's basically what I'm suggesting. That you can't, that's why the title is, you can't have it both ways. Um, Vincent, um, thank you. Um, Mick wanted to um, say say a little more on their question. Um, I've. You can just unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, Vincent, thank you very much. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for your thesis. Uh, I, I just find it interesting that it raises questions about what is intelligence when it applies to um, AI systems. Um, even when you think of, you know, the five-step process for automating cars and so on, um, there's no there's no allowance in that system, even for the ultimate uh, step five of, of automated cars, mm -hmm. for the device to actually regulate its own behaviors. And I, it's always struck me that the conversation about AI and ethics, frankly, talks so much about the technology, but not about the human self-regulation aspect. And that's really why I raised that. Nick, uh, when you say self-regulation, what do you mean by that? Be able to make choices. I mean, you do reference it in, in, in some of your slides when you talk about you might not win the game of chess. Mm -hmm. but, so that, that would be a, a point of self-regulation. Okay, yes. And it seems to me it's, in, it's intrinsic in your model, but I just wondered to what extent we can actually make that 
I think a, a bigger point about the difference between human intelligence okay. and machine intelligence. Yes, I think yes, I think that the, the, I just didn't know the terminology, so to speak. Thank you. So I think that does make sense. Yes, to meet people online that you can you normally know, meet in, in person, but I haven't seen for ages. The same applies to Emma. I haven't actually seen her in real life at all, but had a lot of work with her. So uh, Emma Rutkant asks whether instrumental intelligence is a subset of general intelligence. I, I sort of avoided that issue, to be honest, which is a bit of a cheat. Um, I think the answer is very likely yes. So, so you can uh, sort of, if you say general intelligence is sort of unbounded, Right then, then instrumental intelligence has to be somewhere in there. That saying that would be a little bit misleading, though, because of course there could be a system that has a reasonable amount of general intelligence but isn't very good at some specific tasks. So to some extent, what we see is the artificial systems are often really good at very specific tasks, or extremely good at that. So they have very sort of peak performance at these particular tasks, but then they're completely stupid at some other task or some closely related task. So that's why I'm not so sure that the subset notion is a useful one, but yes, I think if pushed, I think that would probably have to be uh, agreed to. Thank you. Emma, do you want to follow up on that or um, should we um, move on to? No, you can move on. Are there are many questions. Thank you. I'll think about yeah. it, Vincent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, Vincent, can we um, answer Nora's question, please, since it was the, the highest voted one next? Sorry, I'm somehow missing that one. Where is that? Um, is that in the, there is a, there is a bit which is called open. Yeah, the, the top of open. So I can read it out for you if you don't see it. Answered, and there's one that's called dismissed. Um, so it's, can you expand on how the orthogonality thesis does not apply to general intelligence? As you alluded to, the reference frame of a general intelligence can vary and might very well not overlap with the common reference frame in which human preferences are oriented. And as a result, we'd have a general intelligence that is unaligned with human preferences and thus poses a potential existential risk. So... I'm not sure that I understood that thought very well, but um, so there is a real question here, which is whether if you have two different general intelligences, whether they would necessarily come to the same conclusion on, uh, so for example, what, is the, what are the important values? Uh, that's obviously a much, much stronger claim to, than the one that, that we've been making here. Uh, that is a claim that, for example, Kant makes, right? That if you think about it properly, so to speak, then ras rationality will lead you to, these, to, these, uh, to the categorical imperative and those rules. Um, so I don't think that we should assume anything like that, particularly uh, not if we're talking about a bounded general intelligence. So we're so Kant sort of thinks about this as if, as if we were God, everything goes perfectly, then we would all come to the same conclusion. But obviously that wouldn't apply to humans and it would not even apply to a super intelligent AI. And so it seems to me that, yes, uh, we might end up with uh, preferences that are different, but the orthogonality thesis says something stronger than that. It seems to me, it says we could end up with whatever And that, it seems to me, that if you have a reasonable amount of general intelligence, then you would be able to rule out some things as the important goals in the world. Paperclip maximizing, for example. That's the suggestion. But thank you, that's an important point. Thanks. No, no, yeah, do you have a follow-up? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Um, should we do um, Morganston Renee's question, Vincent? 
I don't know what's going on. I don't see these questions. Maybe I should oh, um, close this again and do it maybe. Let me just close it and open it again. I mean, I have five questions that are open in the Q and A. Ah, uh, I have ten. So, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I just I, reopened it. I don't know. It's weird. Oh yeah, it, it refreshes. I think because I've just got another one that's come in, um, which no, is it, Zoe. It, apparently, yes, Zoe is Zoe. As I can see, yes. Okay, should we do that one? So Zoe says, clarify what you think is the relation between intelligence. And goals. He previously struck me that the thesis confuses final and instrumental goals. I wasn't quite sure if it was also part of your argument. So, for example, would you say, could you say that high eye intelligence is compatible with the eye setting any instrumental goal, but only high G intelligence compatible with the eye setting its own final goal? Yeah. Um, another, um, another issue that I've been uh, sweeping under the carpet and you don't want it there. Okay, makes sense. Um, so we just just talked about goals in, in the in the paper. It, it seems that, uh, but there obviously are hierarchies of goals. Uh, some people think that there are sort of final goals and some people think there have to be final goals from which you can sort of derive all the other ones. Uh, I'm not so sure that that is not a Hegelian trap, so to speak, that we can't get out of if we try to try to find ourselves into that, move ourselves into that position, because it looks as though we are, we are able to reflect on goals. So even if we have really general goals, so for example, maximize overall utility, we we might want to reflect on that and then, for example, people have said, oh, that, that is a useful goal, but uh, justice is also important. So it's not the only goal. Uh, so a Hegelian presumably would say, oh yes, and what is your final goal according to which you will say that justice is a goal and, and the, it also has to be added to this, to this story? Um, so, I don't know whether there is a good answer to that. I think there might be a way to sorry, uh, to, uh, to suggest that this is the point where the instrumental intelligence might actually try to cover everything. Your attention, please, for your. Apologies <clears throat> once again <laughs> for all the trouble we are having. Um, just as a reminder, Vincent is currently at the airport, so we're having a bit of um, connectivity issues. Michael, perhaps you could um, join us now to give your thoughts on some of these questions. All right, yeah, I can, I can do that if, if you'd like. Yeah, sorry, sorry for this hassle. Um, yeah, I think I think Mike can try to do this. I need to move now anyway to uh, not to miss the flight, which is the only one in the next couple of days. Okay, so so thank you for for all these interesting questions. And maybe Zach, is there a way to save the questions in the Q and A? Because I think several of these would be questions which I would prefer to think of in the revision of that paper. Yes, we'll make sure that we save the questions be, uh, for later. That'd be really good. So so and Michael will uh, answer all the difficult questions now, and uh, I will move on but thanks a lot for everybody to everybody for participating under these somewhat dubious circumstances and i hope to see you or most of you anyway at some point in real life okay so thanks for now and uh, and bye bye at this point <laughs> thank you thank you i'll be back tomorrow in the meeting
great. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Um, so, as we've said, Michael is the co-author on this paper, so he can field some questions. Are you there, Michael? I'm, uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, so, so do you have anything to add on Zoe's question or would you like to move to the next one? Yeah, th there is something important, I think, to add to, to the question. Um, there's, a, there's this notion, maybe, maybe you're pointing to it, Zoe, of the instrumental convergence thesis, which says that for any final goal that, that a system has, um, that system will convert, there's a set of instrumental goals, which are kind of relevant or instrumental to any final goal. So any goal oriented system is going to converge on these kind of goals. And those are things like resource acquisition, self-preservation, um, self-improvement, all these things. And in the, in the larger uh, narrative about the existential risk of AI, these kind of that these instrumental goals are kind of built in and baked into any goal-oriented system is, is a fundamental part of how um, when we scale the intelligence, it becomes really dangerous because it's like, oh, heck, we're going to apply a super intelligent uh, system to the goal of self-preservation. So there's no way we can just turn the button off, you know, just turn the system off and, and, and things like that. Um, So, so it struck me that in orthogonality confuses final and instrumental goals. The orthogonality thesis is 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 is, is uh, specifically concerns final goals. So it says that 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 more or less any final goal is compatible with more or less any level of final intel uh, any level of intelligence, so that we can imagine, you know, a super intelligent thing counting the grains of sand on a beach. But the instrumental goals um, to which it conser uh, uh, converges, um, those aren't orthogonal. Those are always going to be there. That's that's what. Um, so yeah, the orthogonality thesis is is just purely about the final goals, really. Thank you, um, Zoe. Do you do you have anything to follow up on? Uh, no, thank you very much for um, for that very comprehensive answer. Um, no, I, I know there's lots of other questions, so I'll give way. But um, yeah, lots for me to think about. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so, Michael, we'll, we'll move on to the next one that shows up for me in terms of voting. And then we might have to go random because there are just a few votes and I don't want to favour the older answers over the new ones particularly. Um, but let's go with uh, the top one, Mogensen Renee. Would a super intelligence include a super understanding of ethics? And so would by definition enact some degree of benevolence towards human, towards humans. In other words, is there a, is the existential risk from a limited artificial intelligence rather than a super one? That, uh, that is the question, isn't it? <laughs> um, my, my, my thesis kind of looks exactly at this, but there, there are some some key ideas out there about this where and key debates out there one is about um, the nature of moral motivation and whether uh, knowing a moral truth or having a moral belief necessarily entails or involves the, the the kind of following of that so people point to this debate between kant and hume and so where kant says something like well to know a moral truth or have more belief and to, to is to kind of is just to follow it so or is necessarily to be motivated by it such that a super intelligence, you know, that, that, that has a better understanding of ethics would necessarily be motivated by it. And so it would then enact some degree of benevolence towards humans. Um, and Hume, I think, takes the other side and says, no, it's, that's, that's not the case. Um, and so David Chalmers has a good paper on this where he discusses this. Um, but that, 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 whether these things intelligence and, and ethics or intelligence and value kind of are coupled and whether any other of these properties of mind so to speak that, that, that we can name and point to are coupled um, those are big questions and that's kind of what the orthogonality thesis is getting to it's saying hey no for, for these different properties of mind um, 
they're not necessarily coupled. And, and so and that's one way of reading the orthogonality thesis, that that which we call intelligence need not necessarily come with all those other things, consciousness and, and value and so on. And so if we imagine, imagine then a, a superintelligence without all those other things which in human minds appear, you know, what the heck happens? Um, so yeah, that's the kind of more, um, the more my understanding of the literature on the topic. Um, I mean, yeah, I hope that's okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, so Michael, should we move on to the next question um, from Elodie Malbois? Uh, sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Is the orthogonality thesis a problem only if AI can generate their own preferences? Hmm. Um, I don't know, could, Elodie, could you maybe elaborate on the question a little bit? Um, or what you were thinking? Um, actually, I think my question um, came from a misunderstanding of the, the orthogonality to this. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I was wondering um, to what extent it's a problem if, um, be, well, the idea was if the programmer can um, decide what preference the, the intelligence uh, has then we can we can control right what the preferences are and so how it will act and what decision it will make. Okay, okay, I'm with you now. I think, um, yeah, nice question. It's the the way I'm hearing that is something the the, the concept of relevance comes up for me a lot. Where um, Stuart Russell has this idea that that. Um, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. And so that a system which we say, you know, program to just kind of make coffee for us or go get fetch coffee for us will realize that, that certain things, this instrumental convergence thesis that I mentioned before, that certain instrumental goals are necessary to the fetching of coffee. Um, and so, well, I can't fetch coffee if I'm dead. So I need to devote resources to um, ensuring that I can't, you know, just be switched off. And, you know, if we imagine a super intelligence devoting its full resources to ensuring that it can't be turned off, um, then, then, you know, it's, it's even a really simple goal oriented machine like that, that's just there to fetch coffee becomes very dangerous. Um, so the orthogonality thesis is a problem, even in this case, where it's not really generating its final goal, simply because the instrumental goals that come from having a goal become uh, quite dangerous in a superintelligence. Um, but it's also obviously dangerous um, if it starts having its own final goals, but whether that's possible, that's a big old question. I hope, I hope, did that kind of speak to what you were looking for or? Yes, if I understand you correctly, the problem is that there are only so many goals that we can give an AI. Hmm. And that, 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 that kind of for, for whatever goal we do, according to the, 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 the orthogonality thesis and so on, and that for whatever goal we do uh, give to such a system, it will realize what is instrumentally necessary um, by itself to achieve that goal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about it, but you know, this is, this is how it goes. Um, and that even if it's not kind of generating its own preferences with respect to getting the coffee, say, it will, all those instrumental things um, will still become, will still be dangerous and it will still kind of realize that by itself. So the idea goes. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's the orthogonal. The orthogonality thesis is still problematic, um, even if it's not generating it, their own kind of final preferences because of what the instrumental preferences uh, or goals will be. Thank that, you. 
Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're not going to have time to cover all of these questions. I do encourage you to just go to the Q&A and vote for the questions which you want to hear. We'll maybe get another three or four in there. Um, there are a few tied at the moment. Um, so I'll go for a later one. I don't want to favor the early ones. Um, should we do Dennis Doctor? Um, oh, it went down. Oh, it disappeared. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there it is. As certain applications of AI are dependent on a constant human machine interaction in order to remain accurate, from a constructivist point of view, how do you feel morals are inherently related to AI? And it would therefore be limited to human capabilities and intelligence in general. Is this, oh, Dennis, not okay. I've, I've allowed you to talk, Dennis, if you want to clarify your question a little bit. Oh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yep. so, so basically, it's more kind of related to um, sort of social construction of technology and seeing uh, AI as just a basic representation of an automated process just on a higher scale than usual. Um, would it therefore not always be limited to our own capabilities and our own input? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess it. I mean, the answer is always like, well, it depends what you think, right? Um, in this case, we see with even even for a goal-oriented system for which the final goal is specified. People seem to think that, again, this whole instrumental goal stuff, that it will go places that we haven't specified. Uh, and that it, what we do specify as, as relevant, what we do take to be conventional, that like, will it stick within the bounds of, of what we take to be more at? I guess there is kind of just straight matter of fact empirical evidence that this um, that it won't be limited to human capabilities and intelligence in general because already um, we see these systems you know going beyond or going in weird directions you know that, that there, there's a misalignment or various misalignments in ways in which it supersedes us uh, but also sometimes just completely goes in directions like why the heck are you going that way but where it doesn't seem to be aware of what was sort of meant and relevant uh to to what we specified so to the extent that that's the case um it seems at least empirically true that it wouldn't be limited to our own capacities I mean, is it are you thinking maybe about the, the ways in which it could supersede us and whether or like well or so it is more um, because, yes, in that general, it's, it, it kind of does more than human capabilities. But in that sense, all technology does. For instance, <laughs> you know, conveyor belts or just a basic wheel already does more than that. Than, than, you know, it already helps us in a certain way as a tool. But in that sense, it would always remain a tool until we kind of, well, I guess uh, I would say there's two point of views. Either if we are able to generally create a, an intelligence that is artificial, that would tell us more, I think, about our own construction and, for mm -hmm. instance, coding than it would about the actual artifact. It would just say, I think it would get rid of certain complex. I, I've, I th what I've, I'm kind of worried about working a lot with, with companies in this field is we're creating this kind of Roman column um, where we address a certain value to what AI should, is and can be, but not all AI is, if that makes sense. So it is always dependent on human coding and fee and, and a feed of information in order to make these decisions. And of course it will keep learning on these sort of, of, of on these premises. But if we don't kind of um, increase that, that input, it'll automatically start changing and doing other things because it is, because it, it, it loses kind of that interaction. So it goes on its own way, but whether that is the, whether that supersedes human intelligence or not, it's just not able to be verified. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I don't know if I have much to add there. Um. 
Okay, in, in that case, um, thank you for the question. We'll, we'll move on and I think we can do one more and then we'll be out of time and we'll go into a break. Um, I'll just choose another later one. Um, Antonis Antonio asks, why would an AI machine be interested in reproducing itself and taking over humans? Is there any evidence for a link between superintelligence and the desire to reproduce and improve? And so this, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I have, I don't know whether you're, well, I, I have a certain skepticism about artificial superintelligence that, that, that comes from the place that you're pointing to with that question, I think. Um, namely, one of the key premises in the stories uh, about how we take a simple chess playing program that suddenly becomes a world dominating, human crushing, ecosystem destroying, planet destroying, super intelligence. Like, what the heck happened there? Um, one of the key premises is self improvement. And so, this, this, as you said, why would an AI machine be interested in reproducing itself and taking over humans? This, this, maybe it's best illustrated by the kind of the standard story that of how a chess playing program, for example, or a paperclip machine becomes a super intelligent thing where they say, we give it this simple goal, this banal goal of counting the grains of sand or producing paperclips. And it goes, okay, I can do this better if I'm smarter and I have more resources and all these instrumental things that I talked about before on which the goal, the sort of instrumental goals to which it converges. Um, so it devotes resources to self-improvement, resource acquisition, protecting itself, the self-preservation, and all these things which for humans we think are totally, yeah, of course that makes sense, right? You know, I've got this goal, I need to make sure I'm alive in order to do it, I need to make sure I've got the resources, and it makes tons of sense. But then, and so to that extent, um, the thinking seems to be, well, an AI machine would just be instrumentally interested in in uh, improving itself and reproducing itself. Um, and so when it comes to taking over humans bit, the a story that turns up saying the paperclip story is that, well, you know, I'm now at this stage where I've developed, um, you know, molecular rearrangement tech and 3D printing and so on. I've kind of run out of resources, but you know what, humans, you guys are made of, 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 of atoms and molecules that I can rearrange into paper clips. So it's like, boom, now, now you're paper clips. And so it's, it's not a taking over of humans out of some kind of malevolence, let alone an ideology, but just that it's instrumental resource acquisition. And that's kind of one of, that's kind of the scary part about the orthogonality thesis is that like world domination for paper clips. That's, and those are the weird things. And that's part of the, the paradox and the, and then the curiosity and, and the huh that they got Vincent and I going, well, let's let's maybe write this paper. Um it's so yeah, it kind of kind of depends on whether whether these instrumental things like self-improvement, how much they're really baked in. And I'll finish with this kind of fundamental point and challenge that I have is like, what the heck is the self for an AI system, right? Uh, what is the self that is being improved? And I know there'll be others, other panelists here and other people in the audience who can maybe offer a more comprehensive uh, response to this. But I think um, I think that's a fundamental question. That that uh, that uh, what is the self that is being self improved, and how does that relate to the kind of goals it has? And at this point, we start going into different conceptions of mind from cognitive science, computationalist and cognitivist, and then more non-cognitivist embodied stuff. And I guess, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. So thank you. I, I don't know if I um, kind of addressed it thoroughly. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive response. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you. Um, I got my timings a bit wrong, so we do have a few more minutes. Um, Mick's got a, a statement, but we've had a question from him too. Um, 
Can you, maybe we're a bit beyond this, but can you briefly define orthogonality? A question from Andrew Broad. Yep, Andrew, yep. So the orthogonality thesis is the, the claim, totally hypothetical and theoretical, that more or less any level of intelligence is compatible with more or less any final goal, such that we can imagine a what we take to be a superintelligence being uh, applied to a goal as banal as counting the grains of sand on a beach, or 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 you know something totally, or yeah, the paperclip maximization that I spoke about just before. Um, so it's, and it, so it's that's what the orthogonality that that orthogonality is this kind of uh, don't know which way. Um, that these two properties can be orthogonal with respect to each other, like x and y axes on a, on a Cartesian graph. Yeah. Is that, does that do the job, Andrew? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the, um, the next question. There's quite a lot tied at just one vote, so... Um, how about this one, a, a live question from Jai Parmar. I'll, uh, I'll enable your microphone if... Oh, um, I can't find him in the list. I'll, we can go for another a question. Um, an anonymous question, so I'm afraid I can't enable your microphone, but BDI agents are able to deliberate and reconsider their intentions, where intentions are goals with commitment, during the execution of a plan. Intentions are then chosen by a deliberation function, which can be quite complex. Does this get around the concern that AIs can't widen their goals? Um, and just a clarification, if anyone doesn't know, a BDI agent is, I believe, a belief, desire, intention agent. Yeah. Yeah, tough question. I don't, so I don't know much about belief, desire, intention agents. Um, where I went, and I hope this is okay with this question, thinking is that how, how does, how do we specify what's relevant to us? And uh, there seems to be something with which our current AI system kind of struggle and yet is, is we don't, as humans, we don't even think about it. Um, so that we can navigate between this conference, say, and then in the break, we can go up and make a coffee and we can chat to a friend or whoever we're living with or, or pick up the phone. We can go and do completely different things. And so our goals are, con this is our, the landscape of our goals is constantly shifting, terraforming space. And, um, so the goal space is not set or defined uh, in the sense of being a closed, closed space for which we're optimizing. Um, and current, my understanding of current thinking about AI is that, and goals is that we have a closed problem space, a defined problem, a defined task, and that there, and that the systems are kind of navigating this 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 space to find the optimal path toward the execution of this task and so does this get around the concern that ais can't widen their goals if we're what you know so what goals are we talking are we talking about that predefined problem space the predefined goal there it's not clear that our current AI systems can change that, right? They're optimizing for this predefined thing. Like if we have a chess playing program, right? It's playing chess. Can it get up and start you know, brushing its teeth or doing these other things? Like, no, it's just, just doing that. And so to that extent, it doesn't seem like it can widen its goals. But in that choice space, in that problem space, it seems like, there is a certain amount of choice in that it can play and widen and narrow what it wants to do, so to speak, and to achieve that. So, so there is a sort of, there is an, an important sense in which, um, as you said, yeah, intentions are then chosen by a deliberation function. And so 
Maybe I'll try to summarize my, my response here by saying, are we navigating a predefined problem space? Right? In which case we're dealing with a kind of optimization problem. Or are we navigating an open-ended space? And which which seems to be the case with most, you know, as, as humans that you know have a conversation here and get up and do something here and do something here, and there are more or less optimal ways of doing it, but it's not like okay, we've gotten to you know, the goals are constantly changing. So it's um our goals become our frames of reference change and, and, and widen and narrow and so on. Um, so to the extent that it's possible to widen and narrow goals in a predefined problem space, um, I think you're right. If that's a meaningful sense of widening and narrowing the goals, I think that's an important question. Thank you. Um, that's about all we have time for. Uh, I don't want to commit Michael to any extra work or answering, um, but he may be able to look at the questions or the comments in the chat. I'm sorry that we haven't managed to get through everything. Um, just on, on that point, the Q&A system has been slightly experimental with this, with this voting. If you do have any feedback about that or you think of any improvements, um, just type it in the chat and we'll, we'll see if we, if we can refine anything for next time. Um, but thanks to Michael again for answering the questions. We're gonna take a 10 minute break now, and then we're going to have Paula Boddington um, giving her presentation after that. Um, so see you all at 10 past and thanks for coming. And thanks to Michael and Vincent for giving the talk and answering questions on Michael's case. Cheers.
Hi everyone, we are now back uh, to the live stream. Welcome everyone joining on YouTube. We're moving into the second talk of the day. We have now Dr. Paula Boddington. She is a senior researcher in philosophy at the New College of the Humanities, founding editor of the journal AI and Ethics, and she was part of the two of the AI for People 2020 committees. Today, she will be presenting us philosophy of AI through the theory and practice of dementia. Welcome, Paula. Um, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, it's amazing how often one can make that blunder, even after like nearly a year of lockdown. Thanks. Hello, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks, thanks for, um, thanks for being here today. When you could be so many other places, uh, I'll just try and share my screen. Um, this is it. Oh, hang on. I've just done the wrong thing. Sorry. 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 No worries. Sorry. I can't get. I could never get the hang of how you share a bit with the. Um, so you have the share screen button green in the, in just, the middle. Is, even though I've shut everything down, I'm just getting so much up all at once. I'm doing the wrong thing, yeah. Okay, that's it now. Perfect. Yeah. Now, what I, what I can't get the hang of is how I do the slideshow. How do I do, I don't know, I, I can't stop. So can you see the little um, screen at the bottom? Yeah. Not, um, on the right at the bottom, next to comments. I can't see it anymore. Sorry, I'll stop sharing. Sorry, but one of the, I'm really sorry about this, but what happens is that I, I cannot work out how to do it because if I start my slideshow and then share screen, I can't get out of the slide. I, I, I just don't, I can't, sorry. This is ridiculous actually. I'll try again. No, because once I'm in the slideshow, I can't see the Zoom. Okay, so I'll just share what I've got and then I'll share what I've got and then see if that's any good. So I can share that, but how, now how do I get to shot slideshow from here? Can you see that? Yeah, we can see that. So yeah. maybe just uh, put full presentation mode on. Where's that? I can't see it. Uh, at the bottom. So you can see notes and comments right, yeah. is the, the third little icon. That's it. The third one. Uh, yeah. No, the other one, the one. one to the right. No. Right, that one. The, third, the, the next one. Oh. The third, that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. No now, worries. This is actually, in a sense, that's quite a good introduction to some of the things I'm going to be talking about, because one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is some work that I've been doing with a team of medical sociologists who are ethnographers, um, looking at the experiences of, on acute hospital wards of people living with dementia. And one of the one, well, one of the difficulties for anybody suddenly being admitted to hospital is that it's a very confusing place. And if you add to that, um, the experience of having dementia, it can make it much worse. So, so my experience of, I've done this so many times and, 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 I've, and I've, I've forgotten it. So that's a really good introduction to how confusing it is. And in, and in particular, I think that we can all at the moment um, really relate to the difficulties of trying to relate to each other as human beings because of, because of this, um, you know, we're, we're doing this online. And, and so, so um, I, I hope that's a, quite a good introduction despite the, the, my failings for which I apologize. So, so my talk is looking at themes arising from the chance circumstances of having been working for the last few years on two seemingly very different um, areas of research at once. So on the one hand, for several years, I've been examining the ethical issues in AI. And I've also been working with a team of ethnographers um, based at Cardiff University under the leadership of Dr. Katie Featherston, who are examining the routine care of people living with dementia who are on hospital wards with the aim of trying to improve the humanity of care. So despite the seeming vast gulf between these different areas of research, there's really quite a lot to be learned from considering both of them together. So it's really been a really, really fruitful and, and, and fascinating opportunity. Um, but also there are really striking differences in how these different subjects are perceived. For example, if we think of AI as about achieving the really highest levels possible in cognitive capacity, and we can also see dementia through the lens of a model of cognitive deficit and, and loss. And it's in part because of this noticeable chasm for interesting questions arise. But this talk is also a methodological reflection 
on the value of working in such contrasting fields. And they contrast in so many ways. On the one hand, the lure of the new, the lure of progress of high value on one side, and on the other, the old, the aged, the neglected, and the remarkably unglamorous. If you're not convinced of a lack of glamour, much of our work focuses on issues such as continence care. And in work considering the clothing of people living with dementia on hospital wards, the topic is indeed glamour or its lack. But there's one thing I, I will just say at the beginning, um, because a lot of the work coming from my, my fellow um, colleagues who were ethnographers is looking at ways in which the care of people living with dementia in hospital can be improved. But I want to get out of the way to say that none of the research is, is, is pointing the finger at staff. None of it is critical of individual staff. It's looking at institutional forces. So I'm only going to be able to give you a, a flavor of our work here today, um, which represents both work in progress and work that we hope to do in the future regarding the implementation of AI and other technology to assist those living with dementia. So what I'm going to present is going to amount to a flavour of some of the groundwork for a fruitful conversation between ethnography and technology uh, within a particular setting. Um, it might not be quite what you expect in a workshop on AI, but then always expect the unexpected. So one of the topics which links between these two areas is persons. Themes linking the work on dementia care and work on AI ethics include questions such as how the person is understood conceptually and how each individual person is seen or not seen. Questions of dehumanization arise from this and are an important consideration in examining proposals for the use of AI, robotics and other technology in the care of people living with dementia or for aged care in general and the possible advantages and dangers. But there's also a linking theme methodologically which running through both of these areas of ethical questions in AI and of a work which aims to help achieve the highest quality of care within hospitals, care which values and recognises the humanity of a person, which is the task of facing each of joining highly abstract questions of value with their concrete down to earth application and how precisely we manage this. Focus on the application of technology to context can and should examine the technical and operational aspects of integrating the technology within a specific organizational, institutional and cultural context. We can see this as a focus upon task and upon the efficient achievement of any explicit end goals. But the work of the ethnographers with whom I collaborate strongly suggests that we also need to see and to prioritize a more phenomenological apprehension of how the person appears and how the person as an individual is recognized within the setting of a busy task focused environment. Much of this work attends to the visual presentation of a person within a social context and we also consider the impact of signs and symbols or what we call technologies of attention. Some of the goals of the work of the hospital wards may also inadvertently help act to help eclipse the perception of agency and personhood in people living with dementia, as I shall try to explain. So tightly enmeshed in this is the particular question of how we see and recognize persons, how people may become endangered, how persons may become seen as marginal, and what can go awry in particular contexts and why. This interacts with the more theoretical question of how the person is understood conceptually. There's some potential lessons from the team's detailed ethnographic work examining what happens in the ward, both for how AI or robotics might be implemented in practice, including, of course, the humanity of the application of technology, and for considering broad ideological assumptions driving both AI and the work of a hospital ward. So often a value can become a disvalue when it's taken out of context or when it's permitted to override other values. Where there are sympathies between the values of different spheres, we could achieve much. But the converse of this is that there may be a danger of an even more skewed amplification of values, which might even more effectively distort or drown out the quieter voices. So for example, here are some of the suggestions for the use of robotics and AI in relation to dementia, which make us a little bit suspicious. So here, a suggestion that robotics could provide care 
for the elderly and companionship, suggestions which have increased lately as part of a growing emphasis on technology during the pandemic. Now, of course, robotics and other such technology could have some utility, could provide amusement and diversion. But what we notice that it's routinely described in ways which ignore many of the vital questions. Much of our work casts doubt on some simplistic suggestions for the use of robotics, as I shall indicate. Much of this is because of a lack of attention to the incredible complexity of social interactions and much as well, it must be said, because of very common scorn for care work and for those who carry it out. But the story is more complex than this. So one lesson is how technology can very easily eclipse the person. But this lesson is perhaps made more vivid by consideration of how readily the person living with dementia is so often already eclipsed from sight on the hospital ward, and hence may be in particular peril of being overshadowed by technology. And consider how underlying models and assumptions of value can have an impact. We consider a particular lens through which the person living with dementia is seen, a cognitive deficit model. Now, it's really important to note that none of this is to deny that dementia will lead to certain cognitive deficits, although they can vary quite a lot of different forms of dementia for different individuals. Problems arising from such cognitive difficulties are often, but not always, a direct source of many of the issues with which we're concerned. So our concerns are rather with the consequences of looking at the person living with dementia in front of you through this lens and this lens only, of using the disease model in ways which act to blur the person. This can, too can directly or indirectly lead to serious issues which can impact not just on welfare and happiness, but on health and on disease progression. Now, this short extract from an article chosen virtually at random from Wired magazine a couple of years ago about the use of technology to diagnose dementia illustrates some of the, some of the thoughts that, we've been, um, that we've, been, we've been contemplating and considering the implications of. So this is about, um, as it says here, creating the first global benchmark in history for one of the earliest known symptoms of dementia. So you can develop symptoms of dementia many, many years before the disease is actually manifest in any ways which is gonna have any, any real impact on your life. Um, and just to quote later, later on, to go back to the professor in Berlin, he explained what happens to patients when they start developing dementia. They are driven nuts, this is, of course, this is not my words, but his, because they realize they're going to lose everything they have. It's not so much of an issue when they have dementia because then they are gone. But this process of losing your, how can I say this, your human beingness, and you realize how you deteriorate, that's the hardest thing. So this illustrates our concerns with how now, I want to draw your attention to a common way expressed in different senses in which this cognitive deficit model is linked to the ideas of a loss of human beingness. Now, none of this, of course, is to deny the difficulty and the pain of a disease process. It's to look at the implications of ways of conceptualizing the condition for those people who are living with dementia and indeed for others who may be perceived as coming under this umbrella because what we find in hospital wards is that you may be labeled as having dementia when you haven't. And note too, actually, something which I only noticed yesterday because I didn't even notice it myself the first few times I read the passage. It's not so much of an issue when they have dementia because then they are gone. Note, this assumes that dementia is an all or nothing condition which comes on all of a sudden, and it's not usually the case. Now, we also need to look very carefully at the complex feedback loops that can arise. Routine care practices and the very use of seemingly humane technology can often send things backwards quite inadvertently. And this can especially happen when high level goals and values implicit in organizations may fall out of alignment with the needs and goals of individuals within an organization or an institution, or may fall into conflict with less clearly articulated values. We have many examples from observations on wards which illustrate how chasing goals driven by certain underlying values may be sadly counterproductive. And I'll, I'll have time to just illustrate only a snapshot of these. And this looping, really importantly, can make it very hard to know whether or not we have correctly identified what a problem is, um, which is going to be critical for when you're considering how you might introduce technology as a means of solving the problem. So there is much to be said here, including observing that there are issues around 
how we might view this for ourselves, issues about how we might be inclined to view others. And the work of my colleagues, in fact, illustrates many of this in action. So to summarise our broad concerns so far, uh, similar background assumptions and values found in some approaches to technology and towards people living with dementia may act to reinforce each other in ways which could be beneficial, but which could have really serious problems. The ethnographic approach identified identifies modes of dehumanization and the loss of a person within the goals and values of the institution. And technology must be used in really intelligent selective ways which target well-identified issues to avoid reinforcing current problems. Now, much about this work can be seen at the website for the project storiesofdementia.com. So as I said, the teams led by Katie Featherston and other members in it include colleagues such as Andy Northcott and many, many others. And it also draws on input from people living with dementia themselves and their families and carers, as well as, as, well as um, a nursing staff. Um, interestingly, you, I'd just like to point out that the image you can see of lost of the little figures is from one of the workshops that held by the team collaborating with people living with dementia and their carers and using art as a way of helping people to express how they feel about the experience of being within hospital. Um, the importance of this work is also underlined by the size of the population, so I won't go into too much detail here, but just to emphasise that, that people living with dementia make up between one quarter and one half of all hospital beds. So we're talking about people admitted to acute hospital wards for a condition additional to dementia, where they make up between a quarter and a half of all patients. So it's a really, really large, really, really large number of people. Um, and admission to hospital is likely to result in worse outcomes for people living with dementia compared to patients of similar age and similar admitting conditions who don't have a diagnosis of dementia. And our team's work indicates that some of this can be at least partially explained by unintended deleterious impacts of their care. Um, now, Katie and Andy's book has recently been released. Um, it's staggeringly expensive if you buy the hardback, but the Kindle edition is free to download on Amazon. So um, if you're interested, I really encourage you to do this. It's called Wandering the Wards. Um, Wandering the Wards refers to the way in which people living, living with dementia on hospital wards are seen to exhibit meaningless behaviour that doesn't sit well with a routinized and timetabled efficiency of a hospital. The research has the goal of using ethnography to understand the meanings of the social world. So the goal of our team is to understand some key issues that are of significance for clinical practice. How is the condition of dementia understood? Models of a per person and implications for ethics. Navigating the hierarchical and very structured world of the hospital ward and questions of com potentially competing ethical values. So what are the broad themes, areas of consideration and overlap? We look at some of the underlying values and goals driving hospital culture, many of which chime very readily with implicit underlying values of much technology. We need to look at the organisational culture and how technology fits into this and how people fit into this. There are implicit governing values of speed and of efficiency. We found progress models of time and behaviour and expected timetables. One of the important issues is the role of recorded data and monitoring and forms of accountability. And we look at an implicit overriding lens of cognition, a deficit model of dementia and cognitive impairment. And all this seen together can um, result in the stress of cognition and on time pressures and the organizational culture can result in deleterious impacts on how the person is understood and how each individual person is seen. So in summary, we have found that people living with dementia may have difficulty in living up to the demands of a culture of a fast paced hospital ward, with an expectation of compliance to rules, and where fitting into what is going on around you is prioritised. Deviation is seen as evidence of decline and disease progression, and a person may sometimes become literally invisible, disappearing into the bed. Um, so in a nutshell, the values of efficiency of task 
are very often at odds with the values of recognition of a person by, by themselves and by others. And this can lead into looping into where attempts by a person to communicate are misunderstood and are seen to rather indicate a progression of a condition and a lack of agency. Now, of course, again, none of this is not to say, we're not to say that efficiency is not a value, it's just that it may become out of kilter with other values. And there are many different overlapping and interesting facets of this. So I'm just going to now whiz through um, some of the findings of my colleagues, um, of my colleagues' research. Um, but as I said, but you, if you're interested, please do download their, their, their book and we have some papers which I'll refer to at the end. Um, so firstly, to look at the practice which we call stripping. I think I've gone, hang on, I've gone too, too far. Oh yeah, I've gone too far, sorry, sorry. Um, practices, of, practices of stripping. Now this brings together ward cultures of speed, efficiency and cleanliness, which of course are completely comprehensible in a hospital. They're all totally understandable goals. And note actually that they're goals that technology is likely to aspire to increase still further. So by the practices of stripping, we mean things such as dressing people in hospital issue gowns, pajamas and socks. But the, my colleagues found that people living with dementia were far more likely to be dressed in institutional clothing than were younger patients. We also refer to the practice of placing possessions out of sight within bedside lockers, which were often locked or inaccessible, especially for people living with dementia. And in fact, um, people living with dementia and older patients were much less likely to have any personal possessions on the bedside locker. There are personal possessions such as um, chocolates, gifts, flowers, but not flowers, you don't have flowers anymore, you know, balloons and so on and so forth. Um, and it's really actually common that possessions are going to be lost. So even possessions such as handbags, clothing, and actually really commonly teeth, false teeth and glasses. And interestingly, the neat and tidy wards extended to the person being part of the neat and tidy, it's literally as if they're part of the furniture, extended to the person remaining in bed or at the bedside. Many of the wards had so-called dementia-friendly resources or even rooms. They largely remained unused. Now, the, sig the significance of this, I realise I'm whizzing through this and we have got, I'll refer you to some papers if you're interested in more detail. We need to consider twin aspects of clothing and appearance. And we remember, we're considering this in terms of how the person is, is, is seen and grasped, and the importance of that in terms of relating to a person as another human being with moral standing. In the same sort of way as I'm frantically trying to relate to you as an audience, but I can't see any of you, and I'm possibly hundreds of miles away from any of you. Um, Self-perception and perception by others. And these may be especially important in an acute ward environment to get your basic needs recognized. Emphasizing pace and speed, as we shall see in more detail later, and demands of verbal communication and compliance with instruction within the pace of a ward may be particularly taxing for some people living with dementia. And you also have to remember, these are people by the large who've just suddenly been admitted to hospital, perhaps with an underlying condition such as a urinary tract infection, which commonly causes confusion. Um, this may lead to a loss a perception of loss of personhood and a perception of loss of social status. So for patients living with dementia, may be struggling with the impacts of an, a different, di an additional acute medical condition within a highly timetabled, regimented and unfamiliar environment. And then staff perceptions, they then feed into clinical assessments of their condition and subsequent treatment and discharge pathways. Yet, Attention to appearance, clothing, and personal possessions can act as a counter to this loss of social standing, as has long been recognized by sociologists examining the hospital or the total institution, to give it the name that Irving Gottman called it. So sociologists such as Gottman and Roth, um, Julius Roth talks about the process of stripping the patient of moral and social identity within the institution. The work of others more recently has drawn attention to, to the role that clothing can have on preserving visibility, identity and dignity of people living with dementia. And conversely, institutional clothing can have the reverse impact. And there are so many instances that my colleagues have found where this does in fact indeed seem to be the case on where assisting a person with dementia to, to wear their own clothing can have an actually really quite dramatic impact on their self-perception and how they're perceived by others. Now, 
And again, I'm also going through a lot of empirical research, but also really condensing a lot of background philosophical work, because these all factors all together help to question a reliance on an overly mentalistic conception of a self or the person. Research has shown that felt familiarity with clothing is an important factor in retaining a sense of self and of social position, particularly in people living with dementia. In our published work, we refer to the work of a Canadian sociologist, Pia Contus, who's also done a lot of ethnographic work on people living with dementia, and who draws upon a more embodied notion of personhood and of the importance of social relationship and social standing for the continued recognition of agency by self and by others. Yet the hospital ward operating as it were on a cognitive model of a person, which relies upon verbal communication and readily understanding of a social word of a ward, prioritizes those very capacities which may be weakened in people living with dementia. Now, just to introduce a different topic, which also interacts with everything that we've seen on the ward, reducing risk and preventing falls. This can be seen as an example of how attention to a particular goal of one goal to the neglect of others. So a particular concern to the staff was the risk of people living with dementia falling or having a fall or leaving the ward and absconding. So falls are measured and prioritized. They must be reported as a powerful sense of urgency often displayed the underlying anxiety of staff with repeated warnings to patients, emphasizing the potential risks of imminent danger. And this together with other concerns such as that of tidiness, um, led to a lot of containment restriction and restraint of tightening of care practices at the bedside. So for practices such as the raising of bedside rails or bars so people can't get out of bed, which actually often led to patients trying to climb over the bars and then hence having a fall, tucking in bed sheets very, very tightly to stop the person getting out of bed, technologies such as chair alarms, which if you've never come across one, is when you're sitting in a chair by the side of your bed and you get up to get a stretch and a ghastly alarm goes off. Um, to try to keep people staying where they are. So now again, of course, falls are a genuine issue and avoidance of falls is an important target, especially for older people where it can easily lead to fractures. But this shows the perils of focus on what can be measured, what can be placed in the, a neat category. And all of this is likely, there's a danger this kind of this kind of problem can become increased with the data demands of technology because recorded data may act to eclipse other values and in practice may lead to a less than optimal outcome because attempts to prevent falls may lead to inaction, which is causes an acceleration of decline and deconditioning, especially in older patients, which can lead to really sustained stays in hospital. Um, and additionally, the target of preventing falls leads to these certain restrictions and attempts by patients to try to get around those restrictions can be seen as the person trying to resist and the person resisting can be seen as evidence of cognitive decline and evidence of irrationality. So the behavior is seen as irrational, as pointless wandering, thus feeding into a perception of loss of personhood and of, and of agency. So for example, a patient attempting to walk to the toilet, maybe repeatedly return to the bed only to attempt this again, and rather seeing as a rational activity, it's seen as purposeless. So that's a really quick lightning tour of those issues. We've also looked at what we call actual technologies of attention. Now, these are often found within acute wards to indicate people who are living with dementia. It's also interesting that there are no other conditions that are, these are on semi-public semi -public boards. So there are no other health conditions that are sort of semi-publicly announced this person has this particular condition. Now, they're designed to try to alert staff to particular care needs that people living with dementia might have. But however, um, they bring about specific types of visibilities and invisibilities in the person living with dementia, and it helped to shape understandings, both of the condition and of older people living, living within the ward, because the more immediately visible signage representing dementia actually reinforces the invisibility of the person while highlighting the visibility of their diagnosis. Um, so one of the things that happens is that the signs and the people are often moved independently of others. So you could have somebody who obviously hasn't got dementia with one of these signs by the side of their bed. Um, it risks patients inadvertently receiving inappropriate care or erroneous understandings of their needs and erodes the visibility of the sign itself. But there's also a problem when the signs are actually used correctly because, or rather, I mean, when the sign is labeling somebody who actually has a diagnosis of dementia, 
because we found that the use of a signage indicating dementia leads to a broad assumptions about care needs. So I'll refer back to that sentence I picked out of a quote from that Wired magazine, the idea that dementia is a, is a, is a, is a unified condition. So the signage reinforced the organizational expectations that typically people living with dementia always needed certain high levels of support. So for example, um, there was often an assumption that if you had a sign indicating dementia that you needed to be fed. And those people were often referred to on the wards as, as feeders, which is not necessarily the case. When I mean, you remember that a lot of these people would have been admitted straight from home where they were living in, independently or living with a, a spouse or another family member and fully able to feed themselves. Um, so these expectations informed routine care bad practices for actually limited opportunities for people living with dementia to rehabilitate and to regain their independence. <coughs> okay, so this, this is the kind of, this is, this is the kind of sort of in, ex, example of how, um, without thinking really carefully about what the needs of the people are, you might then think we need to introduce technology here when actually you need to take a step back and see what's actually happening. So this helped to shape understandings both of the condition and of older people on the ward in general. So the dementia patient became a very specific type and classification of the older patient. And actually, actually interestingly, that often, often helped to reinforce people who were quieter. So it often helped to reinforce the idea of that person's got dementia because they're making a lot of, uh, they're, they're resisting and, and being really difficult. It's nearly always viewed as being in its later stages. And again, remember, these are ordinary acute hospital wards. We're not talking about dementia specialist care wards signified dependency and cognitive deficit. And again, of course, many of these people do have some cognitive deficits, but in many cases, it's really pretty related to certain areas or maybe needs a bit more time. And responses to or rejection to care is seen as being without purpose or disruptive and deemed as typical of a condition rather than being a possible, possibly rational response or even just simple grumpiness. I mean, why should you have your dinner when it's time for the ward to say have your dinner? Um, so the signal of a disease condition actually led to a lack of attention to the person. Often the sign was looked at rather than the person, and it's often led to failure to even attempt to communicate with the person. And really importantly, this all led to institutional cultures of looping. So a looping effect has been called the way in which a classification can interact with the people being classified. And Goffman identified this process of looping within this total institution, describing it as an agency that creates a defensive response on the part of the inmate. When he's talking about inmate, he's talking about people in hospital. It, the inmate takes the very response as the target of its next attack. So it just, it just reinforces the idea that it's, oh, there's something wrong with this person. Um, and again, I also really do want to emphasize that, we didn't, that, that my colleagues didn't find any like bad treatment on the part of the staff. These, these, we're talking about what happens when within the institution. You get negative bias feedback loops. So, so in future work, we wanted to sort of examine how this happens with data and records. And we see some parallels with concerns in AI about sort of how algorithmic bias can get baked into the system, which is one of the reasons why we're sort of thinking about this in, in tandem with how you might think about developing technology, because one of the other ways where problems might arise would be in the use of data uh, within a hospital system. So just a few conclusions. Um, the cognitive deficit model of dementia isn't wrong, but we're entranced by it and it can act to eclipse the person. So if we use this cognitive deficit model of dementia as a way to try to solve problems with AI and robotics, it might accelerate decline even more. The background implicit values of a hospital ward um, merge very easily with some of the background implicit values of technology. And these are still values, but we need to unearth them and to see them clearly so we can work out when to take a step backwards. And since we're talking about such, you know, such serious and, and, and potentially really depressing issues, I thought I'd end on a lighter note, a suggestion that comes from my colleagues' work about technology where it's really needed. So when I was reading through my colleagues' data, pay, you know, they've got vast amounts of data over and over and over again. We laughed at this. Uh, descriptions of patients struggling to open packets of biscuits, struggling to open yogurts, struggling to open packets of sandwiches, because they're so hard, it's really hard for somebody, especially if you're a bit older or not very well, to actually open them. So we were joking, but actually what we really want is technology where it's needed, packets of biscuits that you can actually open. And then um, lastly, there are a couple of papers we've written about this. I don't think either of them are open access, but if you're interested, just email me and I can send you copies. So.
that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boddington. Um, very enjoyable talk. Um, so we'll do, if anyone wasn't here for last time, the Q&A system is that you can type it in into the question and answer section and then vote for the question which you would like to be answered as well, um, or multiple questions. Um, and we'll try and take as many questions as we can, just starting from the most voted ones. Um, so let's just take a five minute break or so to um, generate some questions. I think the only difference compared to last time was that last time I read them out, I think this time I'll just give you your microphone and you can ask your own question when we call on you. So um, we'll come back at 10 to and answer some questions. Is that okay, uh, Paula? Yeah, 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 no, so, sorry, sorry I ran on slightly, but. It's all right. Okay, see you in five then. We seem to be having a bit of a problem with the Q&A section. So just so we're not stuck um, on technology uh, making fun of us, how about um, if you have a question, just um, mention it in the chat and we'll try to uh, fix the Q&A for the next doc. Um, so just ask a question or raise your hand and we'll allow you to speak through your microphone just to make it easier for everyone for now. There aren't any questions. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so we do have a question. Um, Paul Crump on the chat. So I don't know if you can see it, Paula, but... Um, um, let's see, look. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll read it out. So can understandings of the human, those living with dementia, be significantly altered within the existing organisational culture? Can we tinker with a system to produce a different understanding of a human, thus different care practices, or does the system need to be abandoned and rebuilt? Yes, yes, thanks. Thanks very much for that, for, for that, for that question. Um, I, it's, uh, well, I, I, but my colleagues are concerned with how we can introduce, because it's, we're talking about the NHS, one of the things we're doing is trying to have to do, how to introduce changes that are going to actually cost nothing or virtually nothing. Um, although actually many of the changes would actually save, 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 save an awful lot of money. The, tinker can, the system can be tinkered, tinkered with quite a lot, actually, I think. Um, one, one, of the problems that, one of the problems that happens, I mean, one of the, that's, that's one of the reasons why I actually mentioned the thing about packets of biscuits, which is not actually just a joke, is, is, actually, is, is actually really real, that actually that sort of thing happens, but that people might be unable to, um, to, to, to feed themselves. And one of, the, one of the reasons for often swift decline in hospital is inadequate, um, inadequate nutrition and adequate and, and, and inadequate hydration as well, actually, because often people are confused because of dehydration. That's a really, really common call, cause, of, cause of confusion. Um, and one of the things I also, we also really stress is that this is stressful for the staff. The staff want to produce good care. And one of the biggest reasons for staff burnout is being realizing you're unable to produce the best care that you possibly can. So, so the tightly organized timetables of hospitals could perhaps be, be relaxed. Some of it is to possibly to do with uh, the design of the hospital ward. Um, but he, here's, here's, here's one example actually, with comparison from different hospital sites. So but, 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 but the issue, why it's called wander, one of the reasons why it's called wandering wards is because of people getting up and walking around and then being in danger of absconding. Now, that could be a danger if somebody, if somebody with, with dementia who's very ill just actually manages to leave the hospital ward, they could actually end up in danger, so that is a problem. But interestingly, um, just based on a few observations, uh, patients who were on wards where the doors were locked actually had more freedom to move around so that, so that they were, were able to walk around because the staff weren't worried about them um, absconding because the ward was locked. So little changes of that can make quite, 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 quite a big difference. Um, so, 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 I, so, I so, I, so I think, and actually even what's one of the reasons why we talked about the signs and symbols, introduced um, with really, really good, really, really good intentions, but sadly not working very well. So, um, I, 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 I really do think that, that, that they can be, and my colleagues are, are, I'm not involved in this part of the work, involved in doing training, um, in training for people. But again, in, in, terms, of, in terms of assisting, uh, you know, work we hope to do in the future is, is integrating this with how you might look at uh, the, the use of implementation of technology. This is this kind of really, really looking closely at what's happening is really, really crit critical. We need to look at the organi organizational culture and what's actually going on before we can possibly, um, in, in possibly really think about whether or not technology might make things worse. So it's even actually looking at a, um, a genuine problem. So, I mean, here's another example of how, um, of how the system could easily be altered. There's a campaign started a few years ago by um, a lady living in, in Wales, I believe, whose husband um, died with dementia called John's Campaign, which is campaigning to allow greater access to families and, and friends onto the hospital wards to help to care for their patients, for their relatives because they would know, they obviously know their relatives far better than any hospital staff. And again, when you're, we're talking about acute wards, so the patients are not very, maybe not built on them for a long time. So something, something like that could actually make a really quite a big difference to the experience people are having. Is, is there anything else you wanted to come back on that? You can uh, unmute yourself, Paul, if you, if you want to respond. No, 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 yes, yes. Okay, another question. Oh, he said, he said no. Um, Michael, do you, do you want to read out your question? Um, you can, again, just unmute yourself as well. Yep. Um, so the idea is, yeah, to mention care work seems particularly important place to get the role of AI and robotics right, recognizing that we tend to lose whatever capacities we outsource to artificial systems. Is there a risk that particularly in, in, in these kind of care spaces that that we might outsource care and care practice and thereby lose that capacity? How, how do we 
like does that feel does that seem like a big risk to you or how do we navigate that um that line how do we draw that line between these systems supporting our capacity for to provide the care and and then kind of it becoming a, a crutch and relying on it and i don't know yes thank you. yes another, another really great question um I, I do want to say actually that but one of the one of the since i've been working in ai and ethics I mean, I've worked on lots of different applied areas of ethics in my career, and I really think this is actually the most interesting and, and potentially really fruitful area, because one of the things it's doing by highlighting the ways in which technology might clash with our real human values, is making us really have to look really closely at what those values are. So I think it's actually really, really exciting. So if you look at work in um, projected works about the future of you know, what might technology might do um, to the future of work, um, one of the projections is that actually we're going to actually realize that um, technology can't really take over care work like this. And one of the things that it could potentially do is make people realize the real intricacy and value of this care work. So um, I was thinking about this a few weeks a few weeks ago when I was there's a video by um, there's a talk by Michael, Michael Osborne, who's um you might know of him, he works at he's professor of machine learning at Oxford, and he's done a lot of work on the future of work. And um, he, he gave a talk a couple of years ago, which I happened to see where one of the things in the talk he was talking about whether or not we might be able to introduce robotics onto a hospital ward and seeing this as a potential place where we could introduce robots because hospital wards are so regimented, which I knew would just crack us laughing because <laughs> there's a sense in which they're regimented in a sense in which they're completely chaotic. You've got the lady coming around with the trolley of newspapers, you've got people visiting, you've got a social worker comes on to see somebody, you, the OT comes on to see somebody else, someone's trying to get out of bed, somebody falls over, so there's diarrhea on the floor. They're completely chaotic. Um, but it's, 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 real, it's realising that kind of thing, the difficulty of the implementation of these things, which is going to actually make us realise how complex it is, but also actually what's going on in the, 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 the interactions. It, there's, it's really commonly suggested. Now, and in different contexts. So it's commonly suggested that say, if you have a care robot helping to look after for, like an, an older person who's living on their own and needs to take medication. Because of course it's really common that you don't have to have dementia. Many, many older people are on routine medications for one thing or another. And, and, and actually it's not just older people. People in general are absolutely terrible at remembering to take their medicine. So one suggestion is that a, you know, the robot could remind you to take your medicine. But, but um, assisting or doing the medicines round on a, on a hospital ward is incredibly complex. There's, a, it sounds as if we're being really critical of staff, but often it, you're re, we are really, really impressed at the skill with which people negotiate complex interactions with, 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 with people. So there are often really, really, people have just arrived in hospital, they normally take medication at home, they look at what they've been given and it's not the same as what they get at home. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna question it, aren't you? You're gonna question it. And are often really, maybe, but maybe it's a generic, and it's a different color, the dose is different, the doctors just change your medication, or this one you've been prescribed, you know, you never take it because it doesn't, doesn't interact badly with you. But really, really complex interactions. So, so I think that there's a risk that we might think that these things are really simple, but they're simply, oh, take your medicine. It's, it's not like that, it's much more complex. So there's a risk that we could, we could think, that unless, and then one of the reasons why we're interested in looking at the hierarchies of, of what's going on in the hospital, is because there's a there's a there's, there's a hierarchical thing with the obviously there's got to be a hierarchy in a hospital. There's obviously got to be a hierarchy. You have to have people in charge. You have to have rules. We have standards of medical law and ethics. We have um, you know medical knowledge. But what tends to happen is that people at the bottom of the hierarchy who are delivering routine care, routine care work are often completely ignored. This is something I feel really strongly about because I've done I've done this work. I've done this work, and you often know much more about the patient. Than anybody else because you're the person who's spending time with them. That knowledge, that knowledge is in danger of not being taken sufficiently seriously. But but yeah, that's I'm sorry, I get too enthusiastic and, and talk at, at too great. So there, yeah, they're right, there is a risk. There is a risk that we might think that this is simple and it's not. It really is not. And if you look at, I mean, I, I hope some of you might enjoy reading reading a book, and this the book itself is only a snapshot of some of the data some of the data. There is there are so many instances when Having the time, it's the time, when staff have got the time to pay attention to the person, so somebody who seems to be, um, you know, almost an invisible clump of hospital gowns hidden in a bed can come alive and you can realise, oh, this person's got far more capacity than we thought. Than we thought. Sorry, sorry, I go on too long. 
Does that, is, that, is that helping to answer your question? So I think there's potential for really, really thinking, why have we been thinking that people on hospital boards who are, who are helping with cleanliness and feeding and continence care and so on, why do we think they're doing a low grade job? Mm. Think about it. This is the most, this is the highest, highest job you could do relating to another human being as they're living the last few years of their lives. So I'm going to get all emotional now. Uh, to be honest, that's a, that's a beautiful response. Thank you. I, my my mother is a is a nurse, and um, bedside manner and 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 the the sort of the intensity of of, of humanity and human care that uh, is involved in um, in in that kind of thing really comes out. And whenever she speaks about it, and so I heard you do something very interesting there, where the question when I posed it was a uh, oh well we'll reduce will reduce the task of care to this very defined thing that we can outsource to machines. And I hear you saying that, well, investigation of this space, what is what we can do with, with artificial systems invites uh, an investigation of just how complex and profound this space is. And we may, upon doing that investigation, go, oh, heck, you know, this is a really big and beautiful thing. Um, and so, and have a better sense of what is worth keeping the human involved in and worth getting, you know, uh, leaving out. Is, is, that, is, that, uh, is that about right? <laughs> that's, why we're, that's why we're so passionate about this, passionate about this work, actually. That's you know, wonderful. Katie here. You can know, talk to Katie. She's, she's fantastic. Thank you. That's wonderful. Okay. We have a question from uh, Zed Turner. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk if you want to ask it. Okay, yes. Zed, yeah. Oh, Zoe, sorry, I didn't put oh, my name on. <laughs> I just realised it came up. Well, just from what you said and also your interaction with the person before, um, our healthcare services are very paternalistic in their approach. And in, I worry that we wouldn't do, as Michael suggested, recognise the, the beauty of the interactions that we have, but rather go the other way and try to control them. So by using robotics, you you remove that interaction between the patient saying, well, this isn't the right medication because it's a robot that they're talking to. Are we putting barriers up to further, further fix our paternalistic structures that we have currently in healthcare that we as patients are constantly battling with? Um, well, yes. So, uh, so uh, I hope so. You're sorry. I'm, I'm checking off your question. But, I mean, I do think actually. I mean, just want to say one thing. I mean, there's, there is some potential for these. There is some potential for maybe some, some sort of assistive technology. For, so, for example, in helping people to use the toilet, because one. So, but I'll just use that. Just use that as a, as, as a quick example about how it could. There could potentially be potential that could be positive, because um, the 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 the. the arm of a project that we're actually doing the analysis on at the moment is about continence care, which is obviously critically critically important, but it's not something that, funnily enough, not, not, I don't really have many colleagues in philosophy who spend much time talking about the ethics of toileting practices, but it's critically important. And one of the things that tends to happen is it tends to become very, very public when, when once you're in hospital in particular, if you're, if you're um, older or if you're living with dementia, and there's a potential that we could have, say, more assistance within the, within the toilet or assistance to help people reach the toilet rather than um, being put in a continence pad or being asked to use a commode. But could actually be um, really, really helpful for people to, get, to, gain, to, gain, more, to gain more dignity. Um, so, but, but yeah, the, the risk, I mean, there is a risk actually, but it could be sort of really top, that we could have sort of top down use of it. I mean, one of the risks I think is one of the reasons why I mentioned briefly issues about data and how data is, is recorded. That could be, depending on what data you're looking at, so we need to have a really careful account of what, uh, how we should, how we should um, record actually what's, what's going on. But I've got a feeling I'm not really answering your question, Zoe. Is that, do you want to say anything about that? No, but I, I think every time you speak, there's some more things that come from it, which is amazing and wonderful. Thank you. Um, as I work in data in the health in the NHS, and I do feel that we don't, as data analysts, always consider the ethics of what we collect or what we could try and get people to collect. We're always making our lives easier. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that's what happens throughout healthcare. Yes. So you've really got three intelligences that you're considering. You've got the patient's yes. view or their carers, which you said as people coming in and relatives, yes. the healthcare people, 
maybe the system actually has its own intelligence that we don't really capture actually it's for and then anything that we introduce with robotics and artificial intelligence i just feel that we might be more sided towards the healthcare in the system maybe not the patient like the staff in it yeah. making it run more smoothly and the the friction factor is always the patients yes yes and it, but there used to be so much so much more points points of, of communication between these different between all these different factors so one, I mean, one of the other factors is, is relatives so my colleagues observed over and over and over again relatives trying 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 to talk to the nurses say to tell it to tell them things about their relative and and often without success but of course again that's not a, that's not a criticism of the nurses because they're they're um, often often really often really busy busy i mean one of the one of the ways in which one would hope that that, that we could use technology intelligently would be to to, to free up time of, of recording and to, but but in order to do that you would have to be have to make certain the data is being recorded really adequately so and actually in terms of in terms of recording data this is looking at what actually happens in practice is, is, a, is a really good lesson for how you might think everything's fine because you've got recorded the data you put it into, the, into a system somebody can gain and lose a diagnosis of dementia on a hospital ward from one shift to the next so how do you record how do you record that and, and I've, I've, often thought, I've often thought about as I get more and more grey hairs, oh, I've got to be really careful going to hospital, <laughs> just in case. Um, yeah, so, yeah, th thanks, thanks for your um, contribution. Thanks. There's another question coming up. Shall I turn to that one now, or did you want to add anything more, Zoe? No, that's fine. Thank you ever so much. And, and hopefully I could track you down and talk about it a bit more oh, in sure. terms of ethics and data analysis. Thank oh, you. Brilliant. Yeah, please, please do that, because actually on the next project, we've got a grant in for as part of it is looking at, at looking at the gulf between um, recorded data and what's going on. So, 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 so please, please do that. Be brilliant. And thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. So there's a question from Anna. Shall thank I? You. Yeah, yeah I've, I've enabled your microphone, Anna, if you want to ask it uh, live. Yeah. I'm happy to. Thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. So um, maybe it's a little bit um, not right on the topic, but I have a question about what you think about this. So provided that interaction with social robots, such as a therapy robot Paro, can have a positive effect on patients with dementia, for example, that it makes it easier for them to open up for human beings as well, again, I wonder what you think about whether it is appropriate to achieve this goal by misleading patients about whether those companions are artificial or not? A brilliant question. Again, thank you so much for asking this. Yes, because of course, um, social robots can be, can, can be, um, um, can be really um, beneficial and therapeutic. Actually, I was sent a little, I should have brought it, a little kind of like furry kind of robot-y thing, but, but, but for use with children to help them calm their emotions, it kind of like gets upset and then you pat it and stuff. I love it actually. That's really great, <laughs> just because I'm on my own in lockdown. Um, but the question you ask about misleading patients, that's a really, really important question that um, we haven't looked at this particular question. We haven't actually included it in our research, but one of the things that people have noticed in the wards is that you will have, have seen, it's similar to the question of what happens in um, wards and with dementia care of, for example, um, doing like fake scenes, like a pub or a railway, or a, a view which looks like there's a window that you can see, you can see out. This was uh, most notably spoken of by one of uh, one of my colleagues who had been in a particular hospital that was in a part of the country with the most spectacular, beautiful views out of a window. And they'd painted, they'd painted like views on the ceiling, which I'm, why wouldn't look out the window? It's like one of the most beautiful areas of Britain. Um, but, but one of the things that my colleagues really strongly suspect is that many of the patients with dementia actually know it's fake they actually know and become confused. So, so um, I, I, I really wouldn't think that a misleading patients, it mis it mis it could actually really happen. It could actually really happen. And also one of the things that of course happens is that we know full well, I mean like, you know, you know full well, you know full well that, um, you know full well that you're like a favorite teddy or something isn't actually real. <laughs> But you, but you can still treat them as so you know, you know full well, like, I, I mean, pet, pets are a good example. So we know full well, but pets are really complex, intelligent creatures who have proper relationships with us. But then, but we oft, we often know that we're actually over attributing that. And that just seems to be something that, that, that is, is part of what it is to be a human. Um, but I don't really think that misleading patients is, 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 
I don't think misleading patients is really, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really complex. I wouldn't have thought it was a goal. I would have thought it'd be something to try to avoid, potentially because actually patients are not necessarily misled at all and they can become qu quite confused. But it's, that, that's the beginnings of an answer, but it's, a, it, it's, yeah, thanks for asking the question. I mean, certainly anything that could have a positive impact on, on patients is, is, is of course really, really useful. Um, and other patients with dementia can be calmed by things like the robot paro. And I'm not surprised because I, I, I myself have calmed, been calmed by, by the little toe robot I've been given. I love it. Thank um, you. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Paula. Um, we're just about out of time for questions. So um, thanks for speaking. Um, it was very good. And thanks for all of the questions. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now before uh, Dr. Strohmeyer's talk. There, there is one thing that obviously we've been trying out some um, more interactive things with, with this webinar. And one thing that we're going to try and do um, shortly is to do a little poll. Um, we've got a question from David and, and we're going to send it out to all of you through the polls um, functionality so that you can all um, select select an, an answer and we'll see what kind of results there are and hopefully it'll be um, something that's a bit interactive, a little bit interesting for us to all see the results of. Um, but that will be in 10 minutes when they start again. But for now, thanks again, Paula, for the talk. And we'll come back 10 minutes time. Cheers. Yes, I would like to remind everyone that um, the chat is alive. So panelists, if you get questions there, just take a look and thank you everyone. Keep commenting. This is exactly what we were hoping for. And if you have any, any comments, questions or information you want to share with everyone else, please keep using the chat and 
we will be back shortly. Hi everyone, welcome back. 
Thank you for answering the poll. You can see the results now. Um, the majority of you thought that will machines ever be as creative as human beings? Most of you thought they will develop a different form of creativity. And asking about, do you think AIs can be unfair? Most of you think that depends on what you mean by unfair. Thank you for these answers, everyone. We hope to share more questions tomorrow. Now we're going to move on to the last speaker of the day, Dr. David Strohmeyer. Um, he is a research associate in the computer science department at the University of Cambridge and part of the natural language and information processing group at the same university. He's also supported by the Institute for Automated Language Teaching and Assessment, ALTA. Today, he will be presenting us ontology, neural networks, and the social sciences. Welcome, David. Hello, I assume you can all see me and I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so I assume now you can see my slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about ontology, neural networks and the social sciences. And as I uh, was already said, I am um, a research associate at the University of Cambridge in the computer science department. And my research has been supported by Cambridge Assessment, so basically Alta. Um, here's the main thesis of my talk. Models in the social sciences make ontological assumptions. So quantitative models, broadly speaking. And sometimes we would like not to make these ontological assumptions just because they're controversial. Now we might ask whether neural networks, so artificial neural networks, could help us to reduce these ontological assumptions in the social sciences. And I'm gonna argue in this talk um, that yes, they can help us reduce ontological assumptions uh, in these models, but they are also not ontologically neutral. That is, there are ontological assumptions when it comes to using artificial neural networks in the social sciences. And what I'm just uh, presenting here is a short version and slightly changed version of a larger paper I've published in Synthesis. So if you want to have more details and a little bit more of math, so I'm going to avoid all the math in this talk, but if you want some of it, you can see it in the paper. Um, just a little bit more my personal background, because I think in this case, it might be important to understand why I'm doing things in the way I'm doing them, which are slightly unusual. So I actually have a bachelor's degree in sociology and philosophy. So I do have an undergraduate degree in the social sciences. And only then did I do mainly do philosophy uh, for my master and my PhD, um, where I worked on social ontology. So I've published on group ontology, primarily on the nature of groups, what are groups. But after my PhD, I've switched to computer science and did an MPhil in computer science at Cambridge and now work there as a research associate in yeah, the NLIP group. So I'm working in natural language processing primarily. And I think that's also kind of important to know with what follows because you'll notice that I use a lot of natural language processing examples. That's because I know most about how artificial neural networks are used in this context. So I just wanted to tell you all of that so that you have a little bit of a background for why I'm doing things in the way I'm doing them. So that doesn't seem quite as weird. Okay, so here's the structure of my talk. First, I'm gonna say a little bit more about the motivation, why I care about this or why we should care about this. Then I'm gonna say a bit about the use of artificial neural networks in the social sciences, what is already being used, what kind of problems there are. Then I'm gonna introduce artificial neural networks in slightly more detail, again, not a lot of math in this talk, uh, and gonna say something about them being a representation learning technique, which I'll argue matters for the ontological assumptions they embody. And then I'm going to argue after that, that there are two sources of ontological assumptions that influence uh, artificial neural networks and how they use. And that's on the one hand input, so the data into engineering and the architecture, basically how you arrange the artificial neural network. Yeah, and then I'm going to have a final summary and conclude. So I'll start with the motivation. Social ontology is full of fundamental controversies. So you will have all kinds of debates about individualism and what is a group, are groups something over and above their members, are they just a bunch of people? Lots of debates, which are very fundamental. And of course, philosophy being philosophy, it's full of fundamental controversies everywhere. So we, of course you also have a lot of controversies in philosophy of biology and so on. But I think what's special is that these controversies about social ontology are reflected in the social sciences to a very strong degree and arguably I would say stronger than in other fields. 
So you, you when I did my bachelor in, in sociology, you would get very different ontological assumptions depending on which theory you were reading. And of course, if you walk over to the economics department, suddenly the, the ontological assumptions they are using are completely different again. And, and it can be really difficult to, to even communicate. And just to give an example of, of what I have in mind and which I will return to is the question of what is a family? And that's a question which you will have to answer for a lot of um, social science research. But it's also a question which is obviously full of ontological controversies ranging from is family something over and above the members to where does it stop, where does it begin, which is already a question of social ontology, which is discussed in the literature a bit. So you can see that this is a very fraught question. Uh, and so on occasion, at least, we would like to avoid these controversies in our models. Um, and the question is, can we do that with neural networks? So given that we want to avoid these controversies, sometimes at least, sometimes we would just like to predict stuff with our models. Can we do that with neural networks? Well, OK, I'll say a little bit more about neural networks in the social sciences now, so about the usage. The first thing to notice, and I'll repeatedly notice that, is that there is a relatively limited use. It's not overwhelming. It's not like every social scientist these days is playing around with neural networks. But there are a few examples, and they are mostly in economics, but also in other parts of the social sciences. I mean, economics is more uh, um, happy to use mathematical models, so of course they will have more artificial neural networks. But there are also other examples, like for example, in uh, um, an early example from early 2000s before neural networks really took off about international conflict, trying to predict when international conflict will happen or trying to predict uh, poverty based on satellite image data. So a quite unusual way of predicting poverty or also research into public corruption using larger data sets. So there are increasing number of examples when neural networks are used. And one I'm gonna uh, point to repeatedly during my talk is the fragile families challenge. So the fragile families challenge is what we would call a shared task in computer science, which means that there is a shared data set and a number of teams or individuals compete in using this data set for training and then trying to make the best predictions. And there is a ranking on who does that best. So in the case of the fragile families challenge, the goal was to predict variables such as GPA, greater material hardship, based on data from the fragile families and child well-being study. So there was a survey done uh, with social science, cl classical social science methods, and then various teams tried to predict these variables on the basis of these survey data. And artificial neural networks were one type of model used for this challenge, for the shared task. Um, I should also say immediately that the performance of all machine learning models, so uh, machine learning includes more than just artificial neural networks, but also includes artificial neural networks. All of these machine learning models were relatively disappointing, at least in terms of you know how much effort you had to put in for getting out not much more than you would get with a standard regression model as you as social scientists or sociologists use every day. So there is a little bit of a of a question there whether they even help that much. But um, I'm going to come back to the performance issue a little bit later, even though it's not the main um, the main topic of my talk. Okay, so now we know neural networks are used in the social sciences even though not always with the best performance. But what, what are neural networks and how, what do we need to know about them for this talk? So I'm not gonna give you a long <laughs> lecture about the mathematics of neural networks. I'm gonna keep it very basic. Um, neural networks are function approximators. You have a function from input to output and your neural network is gonna approximate this function. So I have here just as a little bit of background, I assume here a supervised approach of learning for neural networks. There are also other kinds of approaches, but I assume here that you have um, also the output, the labeled data available. Um, and what you do is you give the neural network input and feed it through these layers, stacked layers of linear operations and some nonlinear functions. You don't need to know much about them other than that they allow the neural network to approximate the functions. When you feed this input through it, you get the output and by the magic of calculus, uh, feed it back and the neural network will learn to approximate this function. That's all we need to know. Neural networks are function approximators trained on data. Well, given that picture, why would not even think that artificial neural networks are more ontologically neutral, right? I mean, what about that is so much better than uh, linear regression in terms of ontological assumptions? 
Well, the reason why one might think that is that artificial neural networks are representation learning technique. To simplify quite a lot, when you put the input through the neural network, so here's your input, you feed it through the neural network in this direction. Well, in, in these layers, the neural network will create representations of the data. So it will create its own representation of relatively raw input. It's never entirely raw, but it's very raw compared to other machine learning techniques and statistical methods. So if you have something like a naive, clay, naive base classifier or just regression, which is the most standard tool, I guess, in the social sciences, then you have to provide the representations already. So you have to engineer your data. So you do what is called feature engineering. And this feature engineering, this creating representations for your classifier or your regression, um, introduces ontological assumptions. So I'll give you an example from natural language processing. As I already said, I, I like to use examples because I, I'm relatively confident about what I'm saying there. So assume that you want to predict the preferences of Twitter users based on tweets. So you basically classify the text into what kinds of books they like, right? Does this tweet express this kind of preference of book or that preference of book, right? You're classifying text. Now, if you use some standard machine learning model, whatever it be, don't have to go into details here, naive base classifier, support vector machines, it doesn't matter. They all pretty much require that you have a selected vector representation. So you basically need to represent the text as a sequence of, sequence of numbers, which picks out the relevant features, right? That's why it's called feature engineering. You pick out the relevant features of the text. And the most simple way of doing that in natural language processing is to use a bag of words representation. So you have this sentence or this tweet in my example, I prefer Shakespeare to Goethe. And now you want to classify what that says about the preferences. Well, the simplest representation is to kind of throw the whole sentence into a bag and just count the words in the bag. So obviously bag is metaphorical. Um, what it means is that you just count the instances of the words. So I have like a predefined vocabulary of English and you can just count each word how often it occurs. So two occurs once, Shakespeare occurs once, Goethe occurs once, I occurs once, prefer occurs once. And you have this vector, so just a sequence of numbers. And you know, it gives a, gets a one everywhere for where uh, two Shakespeare and so on is, and a zero out of where because this word does not appear. Well, so you have created a representation which you could feed into a classifier, but you'll notice that's a pretty bad representation because it will represent, I prefer Shakespeare to Goethe in the same way as I prefer Goethe to Shakespeare. And these two tweets express opposite preferences. And if you want to classify those, so then obviously you're doing something wrong if they're representing them in the same way. Your classifier can't do anything with that. So something's going wrong in the, in the creation of the representation for the model. And you can step back and ask yourself, well, what's going wrong? And you ask yourself about the meaning of the sentences and you'll ask yourself what constitutes intentional meaning, like the meaning of this tweet. And you'll pretty quickly realize that the meaning of the sentence depends on the position of the words, at least for English, rather language is a bit different sometimes. Um, so what it means is that if you swap Shakespeare and Goethe in the places, suddenly the sentence changes its meaning. Um, well, the meaning of the sentence depends on the position or the word order. So that's pretty clear. You can then change representation in such a way that you introduce position. You can use what we call engrams, like pairs of words, and you can use positional embeddings, but that doesn't matter. You can change your representation in tons of ways. The point I want to make is that when you do that, you're basically introducing ontological assumptions into your very representation of the data. Your assumption is that the meaning of the sentence depends on the position of the words. Now, that's not a controversial assumption if you're dealing with English. Um, that's pretty clear, um, the ling all linguists will agree with you that that's the case, that there's this constitutive dependence relation there. But nonetheless, I want to point out that even in this very standard case, we are introducing ontological assumptions during the feature engineering. And when we look to the social case, suddenly all of that becomes really problematic. So it wasn't problematic when we classify text, but it becomes really problematic when we, when we start to classify families. So predict Assume we want to predict the impact of family structure and educational outcomes, which is you know, what basically happened in the Fragile Families Challenge, or one part of it. You want to predict the impact of family structure and educational outcomes. Well, the classical social science sociology method 
is to use a regression with survey data, which is you know almost a baseline for the fragile families challenge. And in the course of doing so, you'll have to create codings for the family structure. You have to encode the presence of the parents in some way. You have to encode um, their status, their relationship, and you have to, for example, encode how many hours family members spend with a child. But this coding and this representation you're creating in this in this approach uh, requires ontological assumptions. So, for example, part of your encoding might be that you have a, a place in your vector and your sequence of numbers which specifies the number of hours a family member um, spends with the child. Now, you might also assume that there is a friend of the father who is very involved in the child rearing process and also spends a lot of uh, hours with the child. And now you have to uh, now you have to decide where does the family stop and where do friends begin. When you have this representation, you have to make a decision about the borders of the family. <laughs> and that's going to get you already into ontological fraud territory. You have to draw a clear line about the structure of families, about their ontology. So you see that this feature engineering, when you apply it to social cases, is, is going to get much more controversial than it was in my natural language processing example. OK. Well, as I said, as a form of representation learning, artificial neural networks largely avoid feature engineering. There's always a little bit going on there, and you can go into more details and examples there. But as a representation learning technique, you don't you can take the data in a much more raw format. Is the, the is you know the bottom line there? So the hope would be that because it's a representation learning technique, artificial neural networks have few ontological assumptions. And here's here's a quote which sort of uh, expresses the sentiment. It's actually from a paper on agent-based modeling, but they compare it with neural networks, so they make some quite strong statements, which I like to um, point out and then criticize. Essentially, apart from the labels assigned to the input and output units of a neural network, um, neural networks don't have an ontology at all. So apart from the input-output labels, uh, neural networks don't have an ontology according to Paul and Salt. I, I'm going to argue that that's not quite the case. And I'm going to point to two sources of ontological assumptions when using artificial neural networks for the social sciences. The first source is the data and the engineering. So there's still some data, something going on there. And the second point, uh, which is going to be a little slightly more controversial, is the architecture. So the arrangement of layers and other mechanism, academic mechanisms in the artificial neural network. OK, so I'll start with the input. The aim is again to predict the impact of family structure and educational outcomes. But this time, you're not using a regression, you're using an artificial neural network. What data do you use as input when you do that as a social scientist? Well, you have a lot of choices to make. You could use survey data. You could collect maybe online messages or conversation transcripts between parents and child or between ch child and all peers. You could even use image or video data. Artificial neural networks are very versatile in the types of input that you, that you take. So even if you don't select features, as you need to do for other types of machine learning and statistical methods used in the social sciences, even if you don't select features in this way, you still need to select a data source. And that's kind of a great trouble. So the first data source you could you would consider, and uh, which was used in the Fetcher Families Challenge, was the survey data. But survey data already encodes features. So survey data says boxes to tick and has uh, fields to fill in. The data is already very much structures. So the survey will already encode where the family ends and friends begin. So to use my example again of the friend of the father who's involved in child rearing, the survey will already have a, have a field which asks very specifically about that and will make assumptions. So the whole ontological neutrality advantage of artificial neural networks is greatly reduced if you use survey data, because survey data already do the feature engineering to a large extent. What this also means, and this is a slight digression, is that the representation learning capacities of artificial neural networks are largely wasted. Not entirely, there's something about nonlinearity and some weird interactions which you can still learn, which you couldn't otherwise. But broadly speaking, Artificial neural networks are at their best when they can learn their own representations from scratch. Um, and that might go towards explaining the low performance of artificial neural networks in the fragile families challenge. Um, so there they really 
the social client is more or less directly fed the survey data into into feed forward neural networks and it's just not going to be um the best way of doing things i want to add that there's a bit of an exception here um uh, when it comes to survey data that if you have open-ended survey questions which are not coded but just the whole point of open-ended survey questions that you can that the people who are being surveyed can say whatever they want without having to you know being restricted to the ontology or assumptions in general of the interviewers so they don't have an encoding and then you can you can apply artificial neural networks and would have uh, arguably a benefit and that would avoid ontological assumptions but that's just for mandatory questions okay so survey data bad um alternative to survey data is trace data so you have some data of the behavioral traces of whatever you're interested in, right? So you might think about predicting a child's educational outcomes based on text messages or conversation transcripts. So these would be like trace data you could arguably collect about a, a child and uh, its interaction with the family. But you still need to select the trace data. So you're no longer selecting features for the representation and you can avoid ontological assumptions there, but you still have to select the trace data. So for example, yeah, to use my example again of the a friend of the father who's involved in the child rearing to some extent. You might wonder whether the conversation transcript should also be those with this friend of the father or not. And this will depend on what exactly you want to do and your assumptions about what a family is and whether this friend belongs to the family or not. And you can be relatively broad. You can go along, you can say, well, I'm taking whatever I get. I use all the data I can get. Well, first of all, you're going to run into arguably probably still have some limits, but then also you will have probably have slow performance. And even worse, when you do that, you, you will move further and further away from uh, doing research on your spe specific explanations, which was the family structure. You wanted to know about the impact of the family structure on educational outcomes. And when you already when you use text data like this, it's no longer clear that you're really getting at the family structure rather than the child's vocabulary, for example, which is also reflected in the text messages. So maybe you're predicting a child's educational outcomes based on all other kinds of science in this larger and larger data you're collecting and putting in there. So you still have to make these selections and these selections will probably be informed by ontological assumptions. Okay, so here's a quick summary of the input point. Choices of data involve ontological assumptions. Especially survey data are problematic because they have this type of um, feature engineering, which I said neural networks can generally avoid. But if you use them, then you no longer avoid it. Trace data are better because they don't have this, don't require this feature engineering necessarily, but you still need to select between the trace data. So you still have some assumptions feeding into that, not in the representation, but in the selection of the data. Also as a little bit of a digression, there's also tension between avoiding ontological assumptions and the research focus. We'll get a little bit back to that as well. So you see that there are trade-offs involved. Okay, now I'm talking about the architecture point, and I think that's slightly more controversial. I don't think that everyone agrees that the ontological assumptions, that there are ontological assumptions in the design of architectures of neural networks. So here's one quote again from Paul and Salt where they say roughly that. They say, assumptions about functional form are embedded in the structure of the network itself, how the nodes are arranged into layers and are connected to each other. The structure, however, only reflects the flexibility the network will have to achieve certain combinations of outputs and all the inputs it might be given, its wiggliness. This is a rather weak ontological commitment to make to a set of data. So what they're saying here is that the architecture matters for how wiggly your function approximator is. So that's what I said, right? Uh, no networks are function approximators. They say, well, arch the architecture matters for the wiggliness, how flexible your function approximator is for certain functions. I'm going to say that no, it actually has more ontological commitment than just that. And if you use artificial neural networks, you'll probably quickly come to see why I would think that, because you'll you'll hear things about different architectures being better suited for different dependence patterns. So, for example, convolutional neural networks, just one type of uh, of ANNs. Don't worry about the details. But these convolutional neural networks are supposed to be especially well suited for local dependence patterns. They are used more in image recognition, for example. 
while in natural language processing for a long time we mainly used lstms which is a different type of architecture i'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second and these are much more suited for longer linear dependence patterns so not quite as local and, and more linear so here you see a representation of an unfolded um, lstm encoder so what this lstm network encoder does is that it encodes the input so x zero to xt are again the input and it codes them step by step uh, and during this encoding when you put in x zero so the first input it feeds it forward it feeds information forward to the processing the encoding of the second input and from the second to the third and so on so an lsdm network has an encoding step typically where you um, put in the input sequentially and state from one encoding is fed to the next encoding step. And then you have these encoded representations which you feed into some sort of classifier. classifier. So for example, into the kind of neural network I showed you before with the you know, connected uh, layers. But what's important to note here is that there's a propagation of information that is one directional. So there is a dependence assumption here. Let me again use my example of classifying text. So you again want to classify the tweet, I prefer Shakespeare to Goethe. Well, in this case, if you use a standard LSDM, you assume that the meaning of a token only depends on the previous tokens because it only has information about the previous tokens. There are also by LSDMs which go in both directions, but you know, let's assume you use a standard LSDM, the most standard uh, architecture there. So you have, you put in I, you put in afterwards prefer and prefer will know about I, but not vice versa. And so there will also be some information about position there, right? So it, it will be different if you switch your places of Shakespeare and Goethe, right? So using this architecture, you encode an assumption about the constitutive dependence of token meaning <laughs> into your neural network, into the architecture itself. And I think that's very important to see. And it's, it's, Obviously, again, in the case of, of classifying text, it's usually not important. You just use whatever, whatever works best. But if you go to social science case, it might be different. So this example is something which I concocted. So this is basically an example I made up. But I think it's very clear, which is why I, why I still like to use it. Say you want to classify the risk-taking behavior of a company based on decisions by you know, roles within it of the different the roles of different departments and now you have not tokens in this case you want to um which you want to classify but you have like states of the company departments you have some sort of internal representation of the state maybe there's yeah there's already a question how you would represent those states that would be a bit of a question that could involve ontology but i don't want to go into that um say you have already have this representation of the states you have a vocabulary of states that the, the departments in the company can take and now you also know that because of the structure of the company, decisions of marketing automatically, constitutively, defer to decisions of sales. That's just something about how the company is set up in its constitution. It might even literally, there might be some sort of um, constitution or charter for the company which spec specifies this deference relation. Well, if you have that, then you can use an LSDM, right? You can first feed in the state of the sales department, and then pass on the information to the encoding of the state of the marketing department to capture this deference relation. And what, what you do here is, just as in the case of classifying text, you are building an ontological assumption about the company into the very architecture of the neural network. Okay, so I think that's, that's a relatively clear example that yes, architectural choices can matter and can make a difference. But you might say, well, this is not from actual research, <laughs> which it's not. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, a it's a clear example that you would usually get because other examples might have to try to look deeper into loss functions and so on, very subtle details. But I do think that this example also is, is something that's 
actually kind of interesting to think about how it applies to the social sciences. Because the reason I took this not real example is that when you look at the social sciences now, what they're doing is that they're using very plain vanilla artificial neural networks that are not very much adapted to their object, to whatever they are studying. So they really just use very simple architectures um, and do not encode much about the specific subject in them. But as the social scientists will become more sophisticated in using artificial neural networks, and I assume that if they prove valuable, they will do so, they will use them in more creative ways. The social scientists will start to adapt them to their subject areas. And I expect, therefore, that there will be an increasing role of ontological assumptions, similar to the example I gave, where the ontological assumptions are written into the architecture itself. And you might, you might wonder, why would you do that as social scientists if I'm like also saying we want to avoid ontological assumptions? Why would you go down this route and, and adapt them in this way? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, you might get better performance out of it. That's the reason we're using LSTMs in, in natural language processing instead of vanilla neural networks with less assumptions. And also, there might be some users which require it. You might be interested in the, into the encoding of the company states. There, there are some uses where you really need to be close to your subject area and put in the ontological assumptions to then be able to evaluate them. So I assume that this will increase in the future. So I'm actually daring enough to make a prediction as a philosopher, quite unusual, I think. Um, so that's, that's what I think is gonna happen there. Okay, I'm already coming to my final summary. First of all, the use of artificial neural networks in the social sciences is still very much in the beginning. It's developing at the moment. I also argued that there's a justified hope that we can avoid ontological assumptions in the neural sciences, uh, in the social sciences by using neural networks, sorry. Um, because neural networks are a, a representation learning technique and therefore avoid the feature engineering which can encode ontological assumptions. That being said, artificial neural networks are not ontologically neutral, especially not when it comes to input where you still have to select data and where there's all these kind of issues about survey data and um, yeah, trace data. And, but also not when it comes to architecture where the whole um, dynamic is a bit more subtle because some there's a difference in, the, in how much the architecture, uh, how many assumptions an architecture encodes and there are trade-offs to be made when it comes to performance and different types of uses. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, David, for that presentation. Um, for, for this question and answer session, um, I we've normally been using the Q&A function. Um, I've heard from some people that they're not getting it to work that well. So for this one, if you do have a question, just raise your hand. I see that there's a Q&A there already, which we can address as well. Um, but just raise your hand and I'll choose randomly from that. Um, for now, shall we just take two minutes and let people have a little bit of a break and think of some questions? Um, so we'll come back at, at five two. So David, um, there's, you can see the one Q and A. Um, we'll move on to hands after, but we'll do that one first when they come back.
Okay. Um, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, so there, there are two questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll take Dennis's first. Um, Dennis, I'll just enable you to talk and you, and you can answer your question, ask your question now. Uh, thank you. Yes, I was just wondering, um, and I don't know whether you work with this, but how do you feel that a domain adversarial neural network relates towards these ontological assumptions and could it then help gain a better understanding of how we weigh other characterizations in decision-making processes and can we use that further in NLP analysis? Okay, so I, I actually don't use domain adversarial neural networks and I, and I am glad that we had a little break because I could Google them. Um, so, uh, so that's a, that's a technique you you talk about the techniques used where um, where they use data from different distributions, right, from different domains to uh, make basically the neural network generalize better. Yes, is, 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 uh, said that correctly. Yes, it's it's the form of transfer learning. Yeah, yeah, form of transfer learning. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, um, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so. I do think um, there is some relation there. Um, in, in, in a way, you might think one thing you might be doing is to try to make the model avoid uh, ontological assumptions. And that's not a, not, a, not a crazy idea, right? So um, that's something you might have very commonly. So um, you might have a, 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 to talk a little bit about natural language processing here. Um, you might have a language model, um, a, a neural network trained to predict uh, words, basically to continue sentences, something like that. Um, and it's been trained on one set of data, but this data encodes some sort of biases. That's the classic ex example. And now there's a question how ontological assumptions and biases relate. I like to talk about ontological assumptions because I feel I'm safer territory there. Um, but, but there's some relation there. Um, and so then fine tuning or you or then, uh, making sure you're using that from another domain, data from another domain. Say you have um, tweets and you might get all kinds of assumptions into your language model from these tweets, right? Like this will be people who might be, uh, might be skewed towards US American, they might be skewed um, maybe white US Americans, probably more well off. Um, and if you train your language model on that, it will have it will start to have all kinds of assumptions uh, from those users. So if you then bring in uh, another domain and fine tune your network on that or train it on that as well, you, what you're going to see is that you, or, or what you hope, can hope for at least, is that you can um, uh, reduce these uh, these statistical dependencies. Now there is a whole big literature about um, bias detections, bias uh, mitigation. That's not the only thing you can do. You can also do stuff, um, other things with the architecture, with the tweak, uh, tweaking the loss function apparently sometimes might help as well. Um, but yeah, um, using a different domain to make sure that uh, your neural network doesn't learn ontological assumptions um, seems like one thing you can do. I, I should say, I'm a little bit uncomfortable sometimes when I say things like learn ontological assumptions because I'm not sure that it's the right thing to say. Um, it's not like uh, the neural network in this case would not have an explicit representation of the ontology as such. It would have a representation of statistical dependencies, which it would pick up based on ontological assumptions by the users you use. And those kind of ontological assumptions, I think domain adversarial neural networks might help you deal with. But it's a slightly different thing than what I was talking about, right? Because here it's more about the statistical dependencies which neural network reflects internally. Whereas I was talking about is like, no, you hard coded the uh, assumptions into the architecture itself. Um, and it's not just something, some reflection of ontological assumptions in the statistical dependencies. No, it's literally in the way the layers are connected. Yeah, I, I, hope, I hope that's partially answers your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Was, uh, it is something that's from coming from a statistical office uh, from my history. Um, it's mainly about the weighting of questions, but then also I think one of the things that interested me was, um, does everybody understand the question as 
as as as somebody else, for instance, if if I get a question, for instance, being an, an immigrant, do I understand it in the same perspective as somebody who is, for instance, a native or has a different social background or cultural yeah. background? Yeah, I mean that, that's actually so because um, we here at Alta do language learning stuff. It's actually really interesting uh, um, things for us because we develop neural networks for use uh, with learners of a language, and so you often have to make sure what what you assume. You have to make sure your neural network doesn't do things which are too complicated for language learners and things like that. Um, so yeah, I very much um, I, and I, I haven't seen any one of us use this specifically, but but similar te techniques are. Are definitely very interesting for you know um trying to uh, uh make sure you don't make assumptions about the users which are not correct yeah thank you thank you um next we'll have uh Yanis. you're you're already a panelist so you can just unmute yourself and uh ask sure thank you uh, zach uh and thank you david for the talk uh i just uh, oh oh Start my video, so you can see me. Um, so, um, so I like the talk, but I just found your claim, David, about the first uh, source, the input. Uh, in fact, more controversial in a sense or dubious than the claim about the second. Okay. Um, now, the reason is is very simple, right? I, I agree that the data and the choices we make in selecting it already comes with some ontological assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the problem, really. Uh, because it's so, it's such a trivial point in a sense that they, it does already come with ontological assumptions. Why do you then blame A and Ns for these assumptions, right? It's not the uh, algorithm, it's not the artificial neural networks that are to be blamed for these assumptions, right? Uh, it's the data, it's in the data, right? So any algorithm that is fed with the same data is presumably going to be potentially affected by it depending on whether, you know, depending also on the internal structure of the algorithm. So unless you know something more specific about how the data and the algorithm interact, then you can't really say it's really the, the, the uh, A and Ns that uh, are, that's where the, you know, the ontological, um, uh, the source of the ontological troubles are. It's the data that's to blame, right? Um, now, uh, the second, so the second point, and uh, you know, the second source, I, I think that's the, the least controversial. And I, I accept your claim there. Okay. <laughs> well, it's always interesting to see that, that there's a quite different perspective, but well, I, I can see where you're coming from. Well, I mean, okay, the first thing you say, but it's not really an answer that's going to satisfy you. But the first thing you say is, I'm just going to, I'm just being here a bit of a party pooper and tell people, look, don't get your hopes in, uh, up too much about avoiding ontological assumptions. You can't do it entirely. Um, and you know, you might say, "Oh well, that was obvious. <laughs> no need to give a talk or paper about that." Um, and that's that's okay. Um, but I do think that there's something specific actually to artificial neural networks there, and that is because they are representation learning technique. Um, they compared, if you, I mean, <sighs> okay, it, it starts. It starts. Uh, what do you mean by data? Which stage of data are we talking about? But A and Ns can pick up on way more things than if you use. Uh, naive base classifier or whatever, uh, and have pre-selected features because it can only pick up on the pre-selected features and turn direction. Um, now, uh, if you feed in much more raw data into an artificial neural network, it can pick up on much more things. <laughs> um, and it's much more dependent on the input. So because it does its own representation, um, it creates its own representation. It's much more... Uh, <sighs> there's a much more um, dependence on the data not being um, crap. <laughs> because otherwise you have, have, uh, have, an, have get it in quite quickly. So there's much more, as it, as it were, um, while I plan to feature engineering for um, bringing in ontological assumptions, it also acts as a filter, right? Um, to make sure to pick out what you want to pick out. Um, yeah, so, so, so that's why I think that there's an interesting Special thing for artificial neural networks, but you yeah, but you're right that uh, all, all for all techniques. So the question about selecting data sources, you're always going to have to ask yourself whether you're um, select the conversational transcripts also for the friend of the father or not, and and that's just generic. Um, um, yeah, so so that that's true. That's something you also might ask yourself if you're using another technique. Although there you might not actually be able to use conversational uh, transcripts in that way because. 
feeding in trace data, you can feed in trace data into other models as well, but you might end up encoding them as well again. Um, it's more common to use something very raw for for um, neural networks. And so I think there's a um, there's a special dependence on the data there, on the selection of the data there. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Thank you. OK. Um... Let's move on to the next question. Um, we'll do Mick Yates. I'll just allow you to talk. Um, would you like to ask it yourself? Yeah, thank, thank you, I would. Um, so I, it's, I, I really like the structure you put forward on this. Uh, thank you very much. I got a question really goes back to the data and using your Twitter example from the beginning about whether you prefer Goethe or Shakespeare. If you if you add a different kind of data source, which arguably doesn't have as much loaded meaning ontologically, like the things you also link to on Twitter, do you link to Goethe sites or Shakespeare sites? Do you link to people that talk about Shakespeare or whatever, which aren't predefined, they're just linkages. You can actually get a much clearer fix on whether you prefer Goethe or Shakespeare and don't fall into the sort of Wittgensteinian and LMP thing. And I say that as a Wittgensteinian, by the way. Um, so I, I guess I'm agreeing with you, honest, that it's, there's a lot about the data you put into the system, which is going to either load it with meaning or actually somehow try to be more objective about what's going on, if that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. Um... <laughs> So if you're working with neural networks, uh, you, uh, like half of the time, your time is, is at least data wrangling and trying to find better data and trying to arrange the data in different ways. So, you know, it's not as glorious as it might sometimes sound um, uh, because it's more, more frequently about trying to mm, split the text correctly and put the commas in the right point, at the right place. Um, so data issues are very much for front. And, and um, so, so often you, the question is not so much can I not just use these data to avoid it? The question is, do I even have access to this data? Um, and, and if you have, you can. Um, although in this case with the links, so the question is, um, how do you encode information of the links? Like, like, how do you represent what the website is? Like, how do you know that it's a good or Shakespeare site? Um, so there you have to again, create an encoding of the, of the site. Um, and, and you might do, you know, and then you have to classify the site again <laughs> in some way. And you might feed it again through an LSTM or whatever, some classifier to say, is the Shakespeare site, is the Goethe site, or is it one of a million other types of sites? So you're already had running into a problem of, could you even train a classifier for classifying sites in this way? Um, and when you do the classification, you run through the same problem. Uh, and you'll, you'll find, for example, that many standard machine learning techniques will find it very hard to distinguish a Shakespeare hating side to a Shakespeare loving side because this kind of polarity issues uh, or negation um, uh, issues as well are very hard for still for some parts for, for classical NLP. I mean, it's neural networks have sometimes worked wonders there, but uh, also haven't entirely solved it. Um, so, so I, I definitely agree that data matters there, but um, well, it's still a question of how do you prepare the data in the right way. And often you then just end up with the same issue again, uh, one step further removed because you have to prepare the data in the right way and face the same issue about assumptions there rather than, well, <laughs> than avoiding it altogether. Yeah. I hope, I hope that, that answers your question. Um, I, think, I think so. Um, I just really was trying to make the point that the the key in many ways is, is the data that's fed into the system, especially when it comes to how it gets interpreted and the ethical yeah. implications you, of that. If you have like a classical, um, classical class, if you have a standard classification problem, um, yes, it's often is about that. It's more about the data and, and then you maybe have some issues about biases and so on, which you about stuff, but not much more, but there are some uses where it's, where stuff becomes more structured, where you're not just saying, oh, pro Goethe, pro Shakespeare or whatever, but where you are actually trying to get a, um, a, a neural representation. So, so think about the example of the company which I gave, which is admittedly a fictional example, but you create a representation of the whole company and its decision behavior. And then you can compare this representation of its decision behavior to other uh, representations of other companies, which are also neural. So you could then apply um, similar, similarity measures on top of them 
to find out um, um, how closely these companies are related. And when you think about this use, it's suddenly not as much about um, about selecting further data about it, but more about creating these representations and what kind of architectures are good for creating these representations. Because you're much, you're not no longer occupied with a, with a simple uh, classification task where you just care about what the output is, but actually care about the internal representations of the neural network. Yeah, I mean, data always matters. It will always matter for neural networks. It's very, you know, data is often very important um, and can compensate for a lot of issues. but especially when you when you start to think about more specialized users it's not everything okay thank you can i just talk and ask a question oh okay. so, sorry I, I was muted um yeah that's all i said so go ahead Okay, wonderful. Um, hi, so um, I have two questions. Uh, the first um, on attribution methods. Um, so mm -hmm. with attribution methods, to my knowledge, so I'm a philosopher, not a computational scientist, so maybe you can correct me, but uh, they can kind of extract the relevant features or the feature that the system deems relevant for you know, the classification at hand. And um, do you think they are an essential role or tool for understanding the representations in neural networks. Um, I would be interested in you know, kind of knowing your opinion on, on the attribution methods in this degree. And uh, the second question is, um, comes, comes from a human AI interaction perspective. Um, so I'm currently looking into shared representations, which are essential in the human domain, or human interaction domain for joint attention. So that you know, actually know that two humans focus on the same object and have a shared representation of that object. And I'm curious on your take on the similarity or possibility for sharing a representation from the AI and the human as well. Do you think there are similarities ontologically maybe as well? Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, that second question is definitely big. I'll start with the easier one, uh, slightly easier, let's say. Um, this attribution <laughs> methods. Um, so this case goes into the interpretation of neural networks and how they function. And I didn't go into this in my talk, but I actually go into this in my paper. So if you want to read a little bit more about that, you can actually check out the paper. Um, but uh, I'll say a little bit here. And I think, yes, you can find out quite a bit of things. So. One example I discuss in my um, my paper so that a relatively straightforward to interpret are some uses of attention attention mechanisms in neural networks. Um, so a, a, a classic example is you have a machine installation done by a neural network. So you go from from English to French, I think is the example and standard example. And you know um, at least the example I use in my paper is that way. And uh, the attention will, will give you scores which allow you to see which English words were most important for the creation of which French word. Um, so, okay, we cannot discuss whether it's the case of ontological dependence, um, and I'm not sure I want to uh, commit to anything here. Um, but you see how uh, you can see the very clear interpretability uh, uh, benefits of using such attention mechanisms. Um, so that's uh, so there are definitely technologies there. So often, though, it's other things. Is like you look at the gradient, or you look at uh, you find ways of interpreting the weights within the layers. So the gradient is is is, is produced during training. So uh, or, or you can also produce it during evaluation, but standardly during training, and you can see which parts of the image, for example, uh, were more important in uh, importantly changed by an, an input example. Um, <laughs> The problem is that it's always a little bit of a, um, the, the, a guesswork um, of, of what exactly that means. So you see like, oh, this region of the image is more important, or this word is more important, has a higher weight. And that's because it's, of course, neural networks are basically a statistical method, um, a very fancy one, a one that's very versatile, but still at the end of the day, mostly about statistical dependencies. Um, so, so yeah, so yeah, I do think that they can help with, with detecting, um, for example, biases and this kind of learned ontological 
you know, this reflection of the ontological assumptions which neural networks learn. Um, but yeah, that's a different matter from the architectural encoded things, but it might help mitigate um, some issues with input. Okay, um, shared representations, right. Um, well, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, for example, there there is quite a lot of research. There has been quite some research into whether LSTMs process language in similar ways as humans. And I'm not up to date with that research. There have been some positive research in that direction. I know that. Um, so it's, it's not completely crazy to think that they're really, uh, so, so there actually have been neuroscience investigations trying to find correlations between patterns and LSTMs or similar neural network architectures and brains, human brain scans. So there are, um, on that very fundamental level, yeah, there seems to be something there. Um, on the other level, um, you train uh, a language model, which, you know, predicts words, say, uh, you have a sentence, you have a gap, and it predicts the gap, um, or predicts the next word. Um, when you train them, you train them on our language output. Um, and it will learn our assumptions. And so the representation you get, the vector you, you get for representing a word from these language models, so you can extract the vectors representing words, um, will share features of our representation. Sometimes features we don't want them to share. So they are like these famous examples of, of uh, sexist bias, which can be encoded in those. Um, but what it also means is that it just picks up a lot of features of, of our usage. And so there is some sort of, um, correlational similarity um, between between their representations in the in the neural network and our representations or the average representation anyway. Um, so does that quite give us anything like shared representations in the joint intention literature? I'm a bit more skeptical there um, because I don't think that neural networks are usually agents because I don't think they're rightly uh, in like the full human sense, because I don't think they're rightly engaged with the environment usually anyway. So the kind of the, if you have like a functionalist picture of representations, you're like, hold on a minute, that there, there's a lot missing in the terms of interaction with the world, um, uh, which might be part of functional profile of the uh, representations we have. So you might think that there is some correlational similarity between the representations, but there's also a huge gap in just because in the way um, neural network representations are not parts of full-blown agents. But if you change that, maybe you would get there. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, we'll, we've got two minutes left. Let's just try and squeeze in the last question um, for completeness sake. Uh, Jacob, um, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna try and pronounce your last name. I've, I've, allowed, you, I've allowed you to talk, so um, you can go ahead and ask. All right. Yeah. No. No worries about that. Thanks. Um, it, you've really already uh, answered, I think, part of this. Um, but like, my background is really all in ethics and philosophy, um, and it it just seems like there is an assumption. Really quick, it seems like there's an assumption um, in virtue of any input that you give a neural network that that information itself is has has some sort of normative value or, or has been ethically vetted as something that is okay for a system to know. And you you have sort of addressed this, but I just curious, is is there something to that? Um, does this entail something about the assumption that the neural network may be making um, about that initial uh, evaluation of the input data? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, there's a huge literature on, on all of those issues um, um, when it comes to biases. There recently been a paper or a blog post, I don't know, it's very similar in computer science, there's very few differences left, um, um, where they looked into, I think it's actually been published somewhere, where they looked into, uh, I'm not sure whether it was GPT-2 or GPT-3, but one of them um, actually spits out addresses and phone numbers of people if you prompt it correctly. <laughs> and so, so you can ask the neural network, where does this person live and what's his phone number? And the neural network will give it. And that's just data scraped from the internet somewhere. <laughs> and you might be, so it, you can see how, how those kind of things suddenly become <laughs> quite worrying. Um, and all kinds of uh, questions about bias um, 
um, are reasonably asked, especially when you have more problematic use cases. So, you know, um, I, I talked about use cases, which are mostly okay, but if someone like Shakespeare or Goethe is probably fine to ask that. But um, there are a lot of use cases which are obviously are very sensitive, like credit scoring. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly you have to ch make sure that your neural network is not um, attentive to the name and whether it reveals anything about um, belonging to a certain cultural ethnic group, right? Um, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so looking into the input is, is a big deal there. Um, it's not everything. People have been started to point out that there are other things you can do. You don't just, well, sometimes you can be a bit lazy as, a, as, an artif as someone working with artificial neural networks and be like, well, you have to give me good data and I'll give you output. And you know, I don't care too much about what happens, but there are actually other things you can do as well. It's not just the input. Um, so there are um, ways of testing your neural network for certain, um, for, for certain biases. I'm not an expert in that area, but I, I'm aware there's quite a lot of literature going on for that in, in, in natural language processing. Um, you know, because there have been just many high profile cases where, where issues ca came up, with, you know, for example, in, in NLP, the, um, the, the Microsoft opening up its, uh, it's, it's a, a bot for, to chat with and then users find it funny to turn it into, you know, give it racist prompts and so on and turn it into um, a racist sexist uh, uh, chatbot. And, and that that's something where you open it up to the public and the input then turns it into a certain way and then, yeah, into a case ethic, pro ethical problems, arguably. Um, but yeah, yeah. So there definitely is a lot of literature there. If, if you're really interested in it, um, you can message me and I can send you a few links if you want. Thank you. Thanks, and that's all we have time for. Um, thanks all very much for coming. Thanks to David and all of the other speakers. Um, I feel like today has been really successful. Um, and thanks to everyone who's asked questions. I'll just pass you over to Gabby for some concluding remarks and um, we'll go. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, really appreciate your participation. We're really happy with how we managed uh, to do this online. So thank you everyone for being active and joining. Just uh, as a reminder, uh, tomorrow for everyone also seeing us on um, YouTube, for tomorrow we have three more talks. We have Professor John McDermott, we have Dr. Ioannis Botsis, and we have Professor David Hogg. So we hope you join tomorrow as well. And if you have any feedback, if you have any other questions that you might want to ask our speakers, just um, get in contact with us. Thank you everyone and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>